The National Desk, America's News Now. Shifting strategy. One goal is to bring the hostages home, and the other goal is to fully eliminate the Hamas. Israel pulling troops from Gaza with new hostage talks underway, now six months since the deadly Hamas terror attack. Frustrating forecast. Several areas already dealing with damage and outages as more storms are predicted along the heartland today, threatening to block the solar eclipse. Being in the middle of the day and suddenly the lights just go down like it's dusk, right? And then crickets start singing because they think it's nighttime. Millions across the U.S. are ready for the solar show. Where and when you can catch the moon pass across the sun. Tearful reunion. Good news, though. Um, we have her in custody. And... You do? Oh, my gosh. Where's my son? The emotional end to an Amber Alert caught on camera. And March Madness. Perfection with a touch of sweet redemption. It's the men's turn tonight after the women's championship was just clinched. Live from the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jan Jeff Coat. It is Monday, April 8th, six months and one day since the Hamas terror attack on Israel. And in that time, Israeli forces did begin a mission inside Gaza to destroy Hamas. But now they are pulling some troops from southern Gaza in order to prepare for a new operation. We have team coverage with Kayla Gaskins covering the political pressure from the White House. But we start with Angela Brown this morning at the live desk following concerns of a possible attack from Iran. Angela? And Jan, thousands of people made their way across the National Mall on Sunday, calling for the release of the hostages held by Hamas terrorists in Gaza since the deadly attack on October 7th, now more than six months ago. Now, House Speaker Mike Johnson marking the memory of that massacre, saying in part here, six months ago, Israelis suffered an unspeakable violence and terror. The slaughter of innocent lives by Hamas will forever be etched in the memory of our Jewish brothers and sisters. And I join Americans across the country who are mourning the loss of those tragically taken on October 7th. Now, right now, Israeli officials believe 99 Israeli hostages are still alive in Gaza. This morning, we're hearing from one man whose brother is one of them who is still believed to be alive. It is horrible um, that we have... I mean, zero um, insurance to know what, what, what is the future of our loved ones. They can die at any moment um, by the hands of their captives. And it's, it's, it's unbelievable to, to try and understand that. And now to a live look over Capitol Hill this morning. You see it here. Top Biden officials are expressing concern that Iran may be planning to retaliate against Israel ahead of tomorrow's final day of Ramadan. Iran vowed to retaliate after last week's airstrikes that killed several senior officials. At the same time, the Israeli military announced Sunday they are pulling troops from southern Gaza and is preparing to go on the offensive on its northern border of Lebanon. Hezbollah terrorists have been exchanging fire with IDF forces there since around October. 8th. Meanwhile, hostage negotiations are underway in Cairo this week. Now, we're keeping an eye on all the latest out of the Middle East and also Washington. New details as they come in right here at the live desk and online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. Angela, thank you very much. And while the Biden administration says it still supports Israel, President Biden's latest shift on the issue is drawing criticism from all sides. The National Desk's Kayla Gaskins continues our coverage. On Sunday, Israel announcing it's pulling out troops from southern Gaza, leaving just one brigade in place. The reason for this drawback remains unclear. I presume this is a tactical decision by the IDF. The move comes days after President Biden demanded a ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war and improvements to the humanitarian situation in Gaza during a phone call with Israeli leader Benjamin Netanyahu. Biden telling Netanyahu U.S. aid was on the line if changes were not made by Israel. It's the first time Biden leveraged aid like this. The shift deeply dividing Democrats. The president and the White House have yet to lay out what consequences they have and they want to impose. And we have had a situation where for months uh, the president has made requests to 
the Netanyahu government. They have ignored those requests. Nancy Pelosi and 30 other Democrats now urging Biden to reconsider sending already authorized weapons reinforcements to Israel. Delaware Democrat Senator Chris Coons attempting to clarify the U.S. isn't wavering in supporting Israel. And that we make it clear we will defend Israel. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the families of those still being held hostage by Hamas concerned Biden's demand for a ceasefire didn't make a pause in fighting contingent on their loved ones release. We want our people back, period. I feel that our governments have failed and I feel that all the parties at the table have failed. Biden's recent shift seen by some as the president caving to the political pressure of ceasefire protesters. Four children are killed every hour in Gaza. Who came out in hundreds of thousands to make their discontent heard during important primaries. And as the president attempts to walk this political tightrope, he appears to be angering many and pleasing few, ringing alarm bells for his chances of re-election. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins. And we're also following rising tensions from pro-Palestinian activists here in the U.S. There is video of speakers at a rally in Dearborn, Michigan, a district held by progressive Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. The crowd yells, death to America, and a speaker refers to President Biden as Genocide Joe and calls for death to Israel. Later today, the House and Senate return to Capitol Hill from Easter break, and lawmakers have their work cut out for them, including possible foreign aid packages for Israel and Ukraine, articles of impeachment against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas in the Senate, funding for the reconstruction of Baltimore's Key Bridge, and a bill to divest TikTok from Chinese ownership that has stalled in the Senate. New video of the U.S. showing solidarity with our allies in the South China Sea holding joint military drills with Australia, Japan, and the Philippines. The drill aimed to show their commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific, an area with several islands that China has tried to claim as its own territory. And right here at the live desk, we're tracking major outages in Colorado after high winds knocked out power for hundreds of thousands of people. At one point, more than 300,000 people were in the dark. Now, we just updated these numbers for you this morning. Things are, though, much improved. Right now, 61,000 are reporting outages across the state. And take a look at this brand new video right here, just sent to the live desk overnight from Littleton, Colorado, capturing huge pine uh, trees just toppled over right there. And one Sunday, and on Sunday, top wind gusts reached between 80 to 95 miles per hour in some areas as well. And now to a look at the National Desk Radar. You can see it right here as we look ahead to threads spanning over parts of Texas, um, Arkansas, Tennessee. You see it right down there. You can see that band of storms moving over middle Tennessee later this morning. Jan, so there's a lot we're watching here. I know, and Angela, when you take a look at this, unfortunately, we know that today's severe weather threat could impact millions, hoping to get a glimpse of today's once-in-a-lifetime view of the total solar eclipse. A lot of people could be disappointed. Right. I mean, you talk about some bad timing here. Clouds could obscure some some views here. You know, you have it absolutely right, Jan. Now, we're going to take you live right now over Dallas, Texas, where, as you said, lots of people are looking forward to taking a look at that total solar eclipse later today. It starts at around 12.32 p.m. with just under four minutes of totality from 1.40 to 1.44 p.m. local time. Now, even if the storm holds off, forecasters predict clouds could hinder today's view. That main threat today will be large hail, though tornadoes are also possible in some cases. An estimated 31 million people live in the part of totality spanning over 15 states as well as parts of Mexico and also Canada. Our national desk partners in Dayton, Ohio, WKEF, spoke with one family who drove hours to see the once-in-a-lifetime event. This might be our last chance, you know, to see it as a family, so, you know, who knows we'll, we'll, where we'll be when the next one happens. It's relatively close to home, so it makes it easy to come out and, and see it. And again, here's a look at today's severe weather threat. Texas is likely to have the heaviest cloud cover. That severe weather is forecast around eclipse time, actually, in parts in some parts of Texas. The good news here, eclipse watchers who get clouded or even maybe rained out can watch our live coverage today on the nationaldesk.com. Now you can tune in between 1 and 4 p.m. Eastern as we track the eclipse from coast to coast. Again, that's online at the nationaldesk.com. Good news, though. Um, we have her in custody, and we have Teddy as well. You do? Oh, my gosh. Where's my son? 
Very emotional here. That emotional moment caught on camera when a father learned his four-year-old son was found safe and alive. Yesterday's Amber Alert in Washington State now canceled after police found the boy with his mother who did not have legal custody. Authorities say that she went to his grandparents' house and then took him at midnight. They say she recently got out of prison and made threats to harm the boy and herself. Hours later, police did spot the vehicle she was driving and arrested her. The boy was there unharmed and now this morning back with his dad. New signs of progress to clean up the Baltimore Harbor after the deadly bridge collapse. Salvage crews began removing containers from the deck of the cargo ship that crashed into the bridge and workers are removing parts of the bridge that fell on that ship. Maryland Governor Wes Moore said he hopes they can get the harbor running as normal again by the end of May. A growing number of Americans are stunned by just how high their bills are rising. Popular family restaurants now too expensive for the whole family. The National Desk's Janae Bowens looked into it. The struggle is real for Americans who have been experiencing rising grocery prices for years. Everything has gotten more and more and more expensive. My gosh, do I have a coupon? <laughs> a new report from the Wall Street Journal shows $100 at the grocery store just doesn't go as far as it did five years ago. Today, that same grocery list costs 36.5% more. Food prices, like any sort of basic necessity, um, are going to disproportionately affect poorer consumers because they have fewer dollars to spend. Items like beef, fruit snacks, and mayonnaise are more than 50% more expensive than back in 2019. And consumers are also feeling the pinch eating out. There was a time when a trip to Olive Garden was affordable. The restaurant's parent company reported much lower sales among Americans who make below $75,000. When it comes to uh, the grocery store, when it comes to going to, out to eat, um, if you see a 20, 30 percent increase in those prices and you're uh, on the lower end of the income scale, well, you're going to scale back or not go at all. And as the Daily Mail points out, McDonald's prices have doubled in 10 years. Back in 2014, a 10-piece McNugget meal was just $5.99. Today, you're going to have to pay $10.99. And if the shake machine is working, you'll pay $4.49 for an Oreo McFlurry. Ten years ago, it was just $2.39. We certainly have seen uh, the rate of price increases slow, if not stop, in the last few months. That's good news. The bad news is that they're stopping at a very high level relative to just 2019. New inflation numbers are coming out next week. The Biden administration and economists are boasting of cooling inflation in recent months, but to the average American, prices are still higher than pre-pandemic. I'm Janae Bowens reporting. Ahead this morning, border crisis, new illegal entries caught on camera as more U.S. cities are strained from the surge of migrants. Long-lasting effects, new information about illnesses that people can experience long after COVID or COVID vaccines. And right here at the live desk, the latest after a deadly weekend shooting near downtown Miami, two dead and a half a dozen people injured. We're going to have the details coming up in 90 seconds.
And victims are recovering this morning after a deadly weekend shooting at a martini bar inside of a busy shopping center in downtown Miami on Saturday. Police say the shooter was taken out by officers at the scene. Sadly, the other person killed was the head security guard at Durrell's Martini Bar. You're looking at him right here, George Castellanos, just 23 years old. Police say two patrons got into some sort of an argument, and he was shot twice while trying to break up that fight. Now, he leaves behind a girlfriend and also his one-year-old daughter. Six others were shot, including a police officer and the owner of the Martini Bar. Thankfully, all of those victims are expected to survive. We are checking to see if Friday's job numbers could be revised down after what happened with 12 of the past 14 reports. On Friday, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported 303,000 workers were hired last month, but the job gains have largely gone to foreign-born workers, both legal and illegal immigrants. From February 2020 to this past March, the number of migrant workers grew to 3.4 million, while the number of U.S.-born workers declined by 78,000 over the same period. And we continue to follow the border crisis with more signs that migrants are trying to enter the U.S. illegally. The National Desk's Kayla Gaskins reports. New video from the southern border shows a crowd of migrants cutting razor wire to enter Texas illegally under the cover of night. <laughs> the video reportedly taken this past week from the Mexican side of the border in Ciudad Juarez. Some migrants appear to make it through. Others pushed back by Texas forces. The installation of this razor wire along the border is central to an ongoing federal legal battle between Texas and the U.S. Justice Department. Illegal immigration into Texas has gone down 72 percent because of the resistance that we've put up. Has gone up, however, uh, in the other border states. Meanwhile, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas calling Abbott's effort ineffective when talking to reporters on Friday. Mayorkas accusing Texas of purposefully trying to create disorder at the border. Abbott says they're simply cleaning up a mess made by Washington. Joe Biden has uh, created this open border policy that has allowed illegal immigrants into our country uh, to uh, appeal to and to appease uh, the far leftist uh, in the Democrat Party. Look, there is a challenge at the border, right? Our immigration system has been broken for decades before, even before this president became president, obviously, three years, more than three years ago. Last week, Texas arresting 214 migrants involved in a riot at the border on March 21st. <laughs> As Texas cracks down, fellow border states like California are experiencing an uptick in illegal crossings. It used to be in previous administrations uh, in Washington, Washington, D.C., when people would come across the country illegally, they would try to avoid Border Patrol. Now they run to the Border Patrol. They know all the right questions to ask, and statements to make, to, to ask for asylum. This comes as more and more voters see immigration problems impacting other big issues like crime, drugs, national spending, and national security, making immigration the number one issue for most voters as they look ahead to November's elections in Washington. I'm Kayla Gaskins. There's some new video of the Royal Bahamas Defense Forces arresting 257 Haitian migrants. Authorities call this a large-scale migrant smuggling operation. Crews intercepted their boat 24 miles south of the Bahamas, and now immigration authorities are processing the migrants. The Bahamas did launch an operation last month to try and deter illegal immigration. New information about an arson at the Vermont office of Senator Bernie Sanders. Burlington police arrested a 35-year-old man from California. The arrest was made hours after police released these surveillance images. They say the suspects set fire to the building on Friday. No one was injured. There's been an uptick in blood clots and a vein problem called May Thurner syndrome as reported by independent physicians who claim it could be caused by or worsened by COVID or COVID vaccines. Full Measures Cheryl Atkinson reports what doctors are learning in the pandemic's aftermath. Good day, she does go out for a walk. She At a recent medical conference in Phoenix, Arizona, we caught up with Dr. Vaughn, CEO of MedHelp Clinics in Birmingham, Alabama, and Dr. Pierre Corey, co-founder of the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance and medical director of the Leading Edge Clinic. It's my belief that the, the medical system has essentially failed. It's collapsed. Together, doctors Vaughn and Corey have treated thousands of patients with long COVID or long vax. We met a few of them last year. Yeah, Andy Sink, 55, had a, acute COVID that required hospitalization. Phil Williams, 58, he's treating my wife. 
for blood clotting. I have congestive heart failure as a result of it. According to an ongoing National Institutes of Health study, up to 25% of adults are stricken with long COVID six months after infection, which could also be long vax if they were vaccinated. Symptoms include mood problems, retina detachment, atrial fibrillation and other heart problems, blood issues, weakness, muscle disorder, nerve pain, and more. Dr. Corey, what are you seeing? I, I kind of differentiate vaccine injury and vaccine um, syndrome. The vaccine syndrome is a chronic illness. The vaccines we know can cause a lot of acute issues. So in my practice, where we've evaluated over 1,200 patients, 70% were long vax. It was triggered by the vaccine, temporally associated. And although we give it this new name, long COVID, long vax, it's not a new disease. It's an old disease that was called myalgic encephalitis slash chronic fatigue syndrome, or MECFS. And that disease has been around for decades, always associated with infections. But with SARS-CoV-2, the incidence of MECFS, or what we call long COVID, is so high. And the vaccines use the spike protein, which is the, the main pathogen on, on the virus. And that's exploded MECFS. Cutting edge for you. What is sort of, are you on the precipice of learning the next new thing about your patients or where are you in that? A lot of what I'm seeing is addressing these people with venous disease and actually helping them get back to where they can walk upstairs, even back to running in college, those kind of things. And those things have been almost what I would call game changers. When we met Dr. Vaughn's patient, 19-year-old runner Ellen Redinger a few months back, she'd gotten very sick after getting vaccinated and getting COVID. Today, after months of therapies with Dr. Vaughn, Redinger reports she's back running in college again. The good news is, is we're learning about disease. We're learning how to treat it correctly. Uh, and we're also learning how to remake our system to truly back to helping patients. Dr. Vaughn says in the past year, he's diagnosed 125 patients with iliac vein disorder or May Thurner syndrome. Prior to that, he says he'd never seen a case. For Full Measure, I'm Cheryl Atkinson. Dr. Jordan Vaughn will join us here to talk more about the symptoms, treatment, and if there is a way to prevent it in our next hour of the National Desk, America's News Now. And here at the Live Desk, an investigation launched into Boeing after another major failure of their 737 MAX fleet. The details coming up in 90 seconds. And U.S. regulators have launched an investigation into Boeing after an engine cover flew off during takeoff and hit the wing flap. Here's a look really at this stunning video. You can see parts of the, uh, the parts flying off. You can see it 
you know, right back here as the plane is taking off. 135 passengers were on board that flight that took off from Denver, headed to Hobby Airport in Houston on Sunday. After the incident, that plane actually had to turn itself around, landed safely in Denver. Thankfully, no injuries were reported. The FAA is also investigating several other recent Boeing issues that could cost the company big money, including a criminal investigation into an incident back in January when a door plug panel tore off an Alaska Airlines 737 MAX 9 jet. Thank you, Angela. Ahead in our next half hour, closing the gap for President Trump calling in a historic amount of cash, spelling trouble for President Biden's re-election bid. I'm Chief Meteorologist Gerard Bailey. Here's a look at your weather across the Mid-Atlantic region. We're looking at mostly clear skies through the time of the eclipse. Very good news. We'll be able to see most of what's going on. There will be some pockets of clouds. We're talking 30 to perhaps 50 percent coverage. A few showers move through after the fact, but better rain chances coming as we head later into the week. Temperatures are going to soar this week a little bit here. We'll likely hit the 60s. No problem on Monday. 70s on tap for Tuesday. I'm meteorologist Vitas Reed. Here's a look at your southeast forecast highs. We're looking at 75 Nashville, 77 in Raleigh, 80 Birmingham, 85 in Tampa, 77 in West Palm. We do have a few scattered showers that is going to kind of give a hard time for folks across Tennessee, up around northern uh, Georgia for the viewing of the eclipse down over parts of uh, Mississippi and ten, uh, eastern Texas. But over southern Georgia and also along the Carolinas, it looks pretty good through the afternoon. Just a few high clouds over, clouds over Florida. Looks like we'll get that front pushing through late week. Well, a very good Monday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael. A little wet weather across the northern plains for the day today. The eclipse will be happening. Path of totality going about right where my hand is, and we've got some pretty decent weather across the Midwest to check out the total solar eclipse happening today. Tomorrow, rain starts moving in a little bit more. The plains, pretty quiet for the day tomorrow, but more rain will be filling in for the Ohio Valley heading into your Wednesday. Good Monday morning. I'm meteorologist Joe DiCarlo. Look at our forecast across the region. Solar eclipse day. We'll start with low-level clouds across Texas. More clear skies though, Oklahoma and Arkansas. So here's the eclipse time frame around 1, 1 30 to 2. We will have mainly cloudy conditions across South Texas. Some breaks in the clouds as you head towards North Texas and uh, partly sunny skies throughout Arkansas. After the eclipse, it's severe weather chances, especially across North Texas and Southern Oklahoma. All modes of severe weather will be possible. Good morning, I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. Temperatures gradually warming up again from California up into the Pacific Northwest. But as we move from temperatures into an incoming storm, it is a warm front and we've got rain at times with mountain snow tracking into the Pacific Northwest with scattered rain showers in the afternoon from much of the mountain areas of the Southwest. That's the scene from here.
The National Desk, America's News Now. Now on the National Desk, America's News Now, back to work. Right now in Washington, Congress facing a laundry list of priorities that are putting the House Speaker's position at risk. Closing the gap, former President Trump hauling in record donations as the Republican Party focuses on taking back the White House. Also, I think everyone should, should experience an eclipse at least once in their life, a total eclipse. It's, it's like I said, it's, it's just an amazing astronomical event. Eclipse across America, a lot of excitement today, but those eclipse expectations are at risk by some dangerous weather. And thanks for joining us. You are watching the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Jan Jeffcoat. It is Monday, April 8th, and the wait is just about over with some visibility of the eclipse starting in just an hour from now. Angela Brown at the live desk tracking its path and the weather problems already getting in the way. Good morning to you, Angela. Yeah, and good morning to you, Jan. More than 31 million Americans are on the path of today's total solar eclipse, including those in Dallas, Texas, which of course you see right behind me. The path highlighted here uh, to my left, you can see where it spans across 15 U.S. states and parts of Canada and Mexico as well. Today's event is really a once in a lifetime experience for so many, but the view could be blocked out by storm clouds in some areas. Texas is likely to have the heaviest cloud cover with severe weather forecasted for around eclipse time, even in some parts. Here's a look at the path of totality. The eclipse will begin in Mexico, around 11.07 a.m. local time there and will cross over into Texas around 1.27 p.m. and will end in Maine around 3.35. Now, city officials, you know, in the direct path have issued warnings about the massive amounts of eclipse tourists uh, that arrived over the weekend. Our national desk partners in Tulsa, Oklahoma, spoke with troopers with the Oklahoma Highway Patrol. Don't drive and take pictures with your cell phone. We respectfully request that you don't stop uh, on the sides of the roads with the infrastructure, um, with one lane roads, it's going to be difficult getting in and getting out. And a live look at the National Desk Radar this morning, where you can see the band of storms uh, are headed over the middle, middle Tennessee. We'll see at some point. Again, the most cloud cover expected is in Dallas, Texas at this point. The good news here, eclipse watchers who get clouded or even rained out could watch our live coverage today on the nationaldesk.com. Tune in between 1 and 4 p.m. Eastern as we track the eclipse from coast to coast. And that's online again uh, at the nationaldesk.com, folks. All right, looking forward to it. Thank you, Angela. Today, Congress returns to Capitol Hill from Easter recess and leaders right now laying out their priorities. First up, Mike Johnson's position as House Speaker at risk of over talks about future aid to Ukraine. This week, he is expected to release his own proposals on money for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Johnson said the funding may be split into separate packages and is being pressured by House and Senate Republicans to use leverage to strengthen border security. What we have is the ability to say you don't get money for your priorities unless you do what the American people need you to do. And unfortunately, whether it's Mitch McConnell or unfortunately too many House Republicans, there's been an unwillingness from our leadership to use that leverage. On Wednesday, House impeachment managers are also set to deliver the articles of impeachment against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to the Senate. Back in February, Mayorkas became the first cabinet secretary to be impeached in 150 years, but Democratic senators are expected to dismiss or delay the trial. And this week, Congress will also consider the approval and conditions for funds to rebuild the key bridge in Baltimore after its collapse. The House Freedom Caucus has called on the Biden administration to lift its pause on approvals for natural gas export projects before discussing funding. People are just wanting change. The rich people want it, poor people want it. Everybody wants change. Our country is really doing poorly. We're a laughing stock all over the world, and we're going to get that change very quickly. Former President Trump shattering his campaign fundraising records over the weekend. The Republican National Committee said Trump hauled in more than $50 million during an event in Palm Beach, Florida. We are going to spend every single dollar that we raise on two key critical core missions for the RNC, which are getting out the vote and protecting the ballot. 
And uh, we're going to make sure that we are focusing on the battleground states and districts where we need to be competitive and making sure that every dollar that we raise is going to be putting lead on target. The Biden campaign says it has more than $192 million on hand. Trump's team says they have $93 million. And later this week, Trump is traveling to Atlanta, where the RNC is holding a similar fundraising event. Meantime, Democrats threatening the Republican House majority and the details of their offensive strategy are being revealed. The House Majority PAC, which is aligned with House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, said it plans to spend $186 million on television and digital ads for this November's elections. Democrats need to flip just four seats, and the group said it's spending most of the money in vulnerable Republican districts in New York and California. In Wisconsin, former gas station chain owner Tony Wong is expected to announce a run to replace retiring Congressman Mike Gallagher. It also comes after former President Trump endorsed White ahead of a big announcement today, writing, quote, As your next Tony will work hard to unleash American energy, stop inflation, secure our border, support our military vets, and protect our always under siege Second Amendment. China could be preparing to interfere in the upcoming U.S. election, according to a new report by Microsoft. National Desk's Kayla Gaskins reports. Allegations of foreign governments attempting to influence U.S. presidential elections are nothing new. How Russia targeted voting systems in all 50 states. This time, China is the one accused of planning to meddle. Where they looked at what the Russians are alleged to have done, and they're envious. So they've been studying how to be more effective in influence campaigns. And frankly, they've gotten a lot better in the last few years. So this is something we should worry about. A new report by Microsoft's Threat Analysis Center notes Chinese-affiliated online accounts have started posting exclusively about divisive U.S. political issues, such as immigration and race, posing as English-speaking Americans. These posts often include polling questions meant to gauge how Americans feel about hot-button issues. Echoing similar concerns raised by U.S. intelligence agencies. Chinese leadership really doesn't like democracy. And anything that undercuts the narrative that democracy is good is useful to them. They want to show that American democracy doesn't work. Microsoft's team believes the Chinese government is behind these posts, aiming to gather information they can use to influence November's election in whatever way they feel will be most favorable to China's interests. The Chinese realized years ago they could take advantage of the First Amendment. So they can put their message out in the U.S. in a way that we cannot put our message out in China. Microsoft also accusing Beijing of increasing its use of AI to spread conspiracy theories about the U.S., like that the U.S. is responsible for starting the devastating Maui wildfires with a weather weapon. China has denied trying to influence U.S. elections. During a meeting in November, China's leader Xi Jinping promised President Biden China would stay out of the 2024 vote. A promise critics say is simply not true. I'm Kayla Gaskins reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. Tonight, the big dance will end with the NCAA Men's College Basketball Championship. The Purdue Boyle Boilermakers are trying to stop the Connecticut Huskies who are searching for a back-to-back title at 9.20 p.m. Eastern. And on the women's side, the South Carolina Gamecocks back on top of the college basketball world. Yesterday, the South Carolina women women's team wrapped up their perfect 38-0 season, beating Iowa and Caitlin Clark 75-87. to Utilize this opportunity to thank Caitlin for what she's done for women's basketball. Like, her, her shoulders were heavy and getting a lot of eyeballs on our game. I think anytime somebody like Coach Daly is able to recognize you and what you did for the game is, is pretty special. And obviously she's somebody I, you know, respect so much. Iowa's Caitlin Clark has declared for the WNBA draft and is expected, obviously, to be the first overall pick. This season, she set the all-time scoring record across both men's and women's college basketball. And just a lot of fun to watch to play, too. Still ahead on the national desk, dumping DEI, another prominent figure slamming controversial DEI initiatives and the impact on the workplace. Washington insider Armstrong Williams joining us next to discuss why business owners are even keeping them in place. Next. Also, 
animals and the eclipse. That's warning about the rare phenomenon and the impact it could have on man's best friend. And here at the live desk, former President Donald Trump set to make a major announcement regarding his stance on abortion access. What we know ahead of this big reveal, that's coming up. The battle over abortion access turning out to be a major player in the race for the White House. And today, former President Donald Trump is set to lay out his plans for the future of that national debate will be. The long-awaited policy announcement comes as Trump is far ahead in the polls against current President Joe Biden. On Truth Social, the former president posted a preview stating his policy will include exemptions for rape, incest, and the protect the life of the mother, but no other details were provided other than that. Now, this marks a pivotal moment in the 2024 presidential race. Until now, former President Donald Trump declined to say when in a pregnancy to draw the line on abortions. Now, we're going to keep an eye out for that announcement. We'll bring it to you as soon as it happens right here at the live desk. Angela, thank you. Radio host Charlemagne the God rips DEI efforts in the workplace, calling it mostly garbage. And New York City is conducting its own investigation into the billions of taxpayer dollars spent to manage the migrant crisis. Joining us now to discuss some of the headlines on the Hill is Washington insider Armstrong Williams. Good morning to you, sir. Welcome back. Good to see you. Let's start with radio host Charlemagne the God slamming diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in the workplace as ineffective. And you heard he said, quote, mostly garbage. You are a business owner, Armstrong. What do you think? Well, listen, the quality of work, Jen, should never be compromised. And DEI should not be encouraged at any cost. Both promoting promotions of people should not be confused with DEI needs. The bottom line is you want to celebrate diversity, but diversity is more than race and someone's gender, it's their demographic, it's their geography, it's certain skills that they bring to the workplace. And you never want to implement DEI strictly because you want to say you have so many women, so many blacks so many transgenders. If you look for the best and the brightest, your workforce will always be diversified. I've known this as my many years as a business owner and the diversity of our workforce. And you don't want to have someone believe that the only reason they're hired is to fill some kind of quota. And what a lot of corporations are doing now is using DEI as points to get a pass against what some workplaces would believe is discrimination and some biases. So it's Never want to compromise the quality of work and the morale of that work environment. So many business owners actually agree with with that thought process. They do not think it improves uh, any diversity uh, in the workplace. So then, why do you think it still exists for some businesses? Is it just for these points, as you mentioned? It's for the points because listen, it doesn't help the very people they're trying to include. And then, Jan, you have to consider, in some places in the in this country, you only have a certain demographic. You would not have what you would call diversity. What are you going to do then? And, and so, listen, it's, it's political correctness, it's wokeness, and they want to punish. They want right. to punish business owners. That's what they want to do. 
I want to go to New York City right now because uh, the city's own Department of Investigations, which is a key watchdog agency there, is probing the billions that have already been poured into the migrant crisis, Armstrong. In fact, more than $7.6 billion in contracts have been awarded. And there is not a lot of transparency as to where this money is going. Why do you think this was not implemented from the get-go, from the bounce? Uh, because they didn't want it to, uh, did not want to be transparent. And what it's insinuating is that people are stealing and using money for other things, no different than how they use the COVID money. This is what happens. You can take good people and you give them this kind of money and you can corrupt them. And, and you will find that the money that is designated it's not really helping those people. It's a it's a way for cre people to create what they call a quote unquote business, where they take the money and use it for all other things. And this audit will point it out. They had to do it for these funds to continue. The bottom line, let's just say who the guilt see who the guilty culprits mm -hmm. are. It's interesting because this comes on the heels of Texas Governor Greg Abbott's visit to the Big Apple this past weekend. He said yesterday in an interview that New York City Mayor Eric Adams was aiding and abetting migrants by having sanctuary city status. Of course, this also comes after Mayor Adams offered Abbott to stay at a migrant shelter uh, during his trip there because he was headlining the, the New York Republican Party's annual gala. According to Newsweek Armstrong, migrants have received prepaid debit cards that deliver double other New York City welfare benefits. What do you make of this and also what happened this past weekend between uh, the mayor of New York City and the governor of Texas? Not only that, Jan, these migrants receive more money per month than a family with a veteran does an entire month. It's actually crazy. And, you know, Mayor Adams has shown that he's willing to push back on the, on the Biden administration on this migrant crisis. And obviously, it's a lot of rhetoric between Abbott and Mayor Adams, but there's a crisis here. This is out of control, and it is It is a sanctuary city. That's exactly what it is. By continuing this, they've accepted over 175,000 people, encouraging people to come. There's no end in sight. It's impacting the housing, but more importantly, it's impacting the delayed lives of everyday New Yorkers. I don't know if you've been to New York lately. lately. It looks like a drug-infested, homeless, third-world country. It is something that you would not believe anymore. New York will never be the same. It has literally destroyed the culture. Uh, and, 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 and the fact that Mayor Adams cannot control it because he cannot keep up with the influx of these migrants that are coming in. So wh who makes the sacrifice? The people of New York and the culture of New York itself. Armstrong Williams, always great to see you on a Monday morning. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jan. Have a good week. Still ahead this morning, chasing totality, the millions of Americans going to great lengths to witness today's solar eclipse. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. We have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From protecting eyes to preparing pets, the Pulse of America is getting you ready for today's solar eclipse. And we start with a lot of folks scrambling to get the best view possible. 
I just, I came in here, I saw the prepare for the eclipse on the 8th, there's a sign up there, and I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled. I saw my brother, and I can't wait. She's one of thousands of people expected to travel here, all to catch a view. Eclipse chasers Lori and Robert Paz came all the way from California. Yeah, I think everyone should should experience an eclipse at least once in their life, a total eclipse. It's, it's like I said, it's, it's just an amazing astronomical event. The eclipse bringing families together, like Kate McKay's. We have family flying in from um, other parts of the country, too, to come up and, and see it. And Phyllis Browns. Her son organized a family reunion, inviting everyone. Um, it's turned out quite a few people are joining us here for the eclipse. And, of course, we don't know that we'll be able to see the sun because it's Rochester, but we'll be out on Lake Ontario, east of Rochester, and um, it'll be fun no matter what. If you look at the sun, even just for a couple seconds, you actually may have some damage to the back of the eye that you might not know about for a little while. Local optometrist Dr. Zachary Long explains why looking at an eclipse can lead to serious health concerns. The sun coming around is actually having that UV damage. That UV damage can get centered in the very back of the eye in our central vision spot. Well, if that happens, you might lose vision forever. He also mentioned that there are some people more susceptible to UV damage child has a very clear lens inside the eye and that lens is going to focus all of that damage to the very back of the eye and unfortunately it's a one and done and you only have one set of eyeballs so make sure that you take care of them the main way to safely see the solar eclipse is with special glasses you're going to notice that they're a lot darker than sunglasses and so you can't really see out of them and so the whole idea behind wearing these is we've got solar filters in here and so those solar filters are going to protect the eye We don't have concrete answers. Because while Dr. Gingrich knows just about everything there is to know about pets, no one really knows what these do to them. There's very little scientific research behind animal behavior and eclipses. Of course, we've had eclipses before, not quite to the totality we're expecting this time around in a long time. But still, that leads Dr. Gingrich to predict. I would not be overly concerned about this eclipse. But she admits. You know your animal more than the veterinarian you come to. Which means if you have a pet that in the past has environmental triggers like fireworks or storms or whatever it may be, then your animal might be a little more sensitive to the eclipse's consequences. Do your best in making them feel as comfortable as you think they would want to be. Join us for Eclipse Across America, a live stream from 1 to 4 p.m. Eastern today as we track the eclipse from coast to coast. We have coverage with over 50 live locations, dozens of local meteorologists and NASA experts. It's going to be streaming on the nationaldesk.com. And here at the live desk, we're hours away, hours away once again from a once in a lifetime view of a total solar eclipse where some stargazers could get their view blocked, though. That's coming up in 90 seconds.
And we are counting down the hours to today's total solar eclipse set to cross over more than a dozen U.S. states and parts of Canada and also Mexico. You can see the path right here. But the view could be blocked out by storm clouds in some areas. Texas is likely to have the heaviest cloud cover with severe weather forecasted for around eclipse time, which is about 1.40 this afternoon. Now, the eclipse will begin in Mexico about 11.07 a.m. local time. We'll cross over to Texas about 1.27 uh, Central Time, ending in Maine around 3.35 Eastern. And we'll have more eclipse coverage throughout the morning right here at the Live Desk, and we'll stream it live when it happens this afternoon on the nationaldesk.com. For now, we leave you with this look at America's news and also weather where you live. I'm Chief Meteorologist Gerard Bailey. Here's a look at your weather across the Mid-Atlantic region. We're looking at mostly clear skies through the time of the eclipse. Very good news. We'll be able to see most of what's going on. There will be some pockets of clouds. We're talking 30 to perhaps 50 percent coverage. A few showers move through after the fact, but better rain chances coming as we head later into the week. Temperatures are going to soar this week a little bit here. We'll likely hit the 60s. No problem on Monday. 70s on tap for Tuesday. I'm meteorologist Vitas Reed. Here's a look at your southeast forecast highs. We're looking at 75 Nashville, 77 in Raleigh, 80 Birmingham, 85 in Tampa, 77 in West Palm. We do have a few scattered showers that is going to kind of give a hard time for folks across Tennessee, up around northern uh, Georgia for the viewing of the eclipse down over parts of uh, Mississippi and ten, uh, eastern Texas. But over southern Georgia and also along the Carolinas, it looks pretty good through the afternoon. Just a few high clouds over, clouds over Florida. Looks like we'll get that front pushing through late week. Well, a very good Monday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael. A little wet weather across the northern plains for the day today. The eclipse will be happening. Path of totality going about right where my hand is, and we've got some pretty decent weather across the Midwest to check out the total solar eclipse happening today. Tomorrow, rain starts moving in a little bit more. The plains, pretty quiet for the day tomorrow, but more rain will be filling in for the Ohio Valley heading into your Wednesday. Good Monday morning. I'm meteorologist Joe DiCarlo. Look at our forecast across the region. Solar eclipse day. We'll start with low level clouds across Texas. More clear skies though, Oklahoma and Arkansas. So here's the eclipse time frame around 1, 1 30 to 2. We will have mainly cloudy conditions across South Texas. Some breaks in the clouds as you head towards North Texas and uh, partly sunny skies throughout Arkansas. After the eclipse, it's severe weather chances, especially across North Texas and Southern Oklahoma. All modes of severe weather will be possible. Good morning, I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. Temperatures gradually warming up again from California up into the Pacific Northwest. But as we move from temperatures into an incoming storm, it is a warm front and we've got rain at times with mountain snow tracking into the Pacific Northwest with scattered rain showers in the afternoon from much of the mountain areas of the Southwest. That's the scene from here.
The National Desk, America's News Now. Shifting strategy. One goal is to bring the hostages home, and the other goal is to fully eliminate the Hamas. Israel pulling troops from Gaza with new hostage talks underway, now six months since the deadly Hamas terror attack. Frustrating forecast. Several areas already dealing with damage and outages as more storms are predicted along the heartland today, threatening to block the solar eclipse. Being in the middle of the day and suddenly the lights just go down like it's dusk, right? And then crickets start singing because they think it's nighttime. Millions across the U.S. are ready for the solar show. Where and when you can catch the moon pass across the sun. Tearful reunion. Good news, though. Um, we have her in custody. And... <laughs> you do? Oh, my gosh. Where's my son? The emotional end to an Amber Alert caught on camera. And March Madness. Perfection with a touch of sweet redemption. It's the men's turn tonight after the women's championship was just clinched. Live from the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Jan Jeffcoat. It is Monday, April 8th, six months and a day since the Hamas terror attack on Israel. And in that time, Israeli forces have begun their mission inside Gaza to destroy Hamas. But now they are pulling some troops from southern Gaza in order to prepare for a new operation. We do have team coverage with Kayla Gaskins covering the political pressure from the White House. But we start with Angela Brown at the live desk following concerns of a possible attack from Iran. Angela? Well, thousands, uh, you know, made their way across the National Mall on Sunday calling for the release of the hostages held by Hamas terrorists in Gaza since the deadly attack on October 7th, now really more than six months ago. House Speaker Mike Johnson uh, marking the memory of that massacre, saying in part right here, six months ago today, Israelis suffered an unspeakable violence and terror. The slaughter of innocent lives by Hamas will forever be etched in the memory of our Jewish brothers and sisters. And I join Americans across the country who are mourning the loss of those tragically taken on October 7th. Right now, Israel officials, Israeli officials believe around 99 Israeli hostages are still alive in Gaza. This morning, though, we are hearing from one man whose brother is one of those who is believed to be still alive. It is horrible um, that we have, I mean, zero um, insurance to know what, what, what is the future of our loved ones. They can die at any moment um, by the hands of the captives. And it's, it's, it's unbelievable to, to try and understand that. And now a look at uh, over the White House, we see right behind me, where top Biden officials are expressing their own concern that Iran may be planning to retaliate against Israel ahead of tomorrow's final day of Ramadan. Iran vowed to retaliate after last week's airstrikes that killed several senior officials. At the same time, the Israeli military announced Sunday they are pulling troops from southern Gaza and is preparing to go on the offensive on its northern border with Lebanon. Hezbollah terrorists have been exchanging fire with IDF forces there since October 7th. Meanwhile, hostage negotiations are underway in Cairo this week as well. We're keeping our eyes on the latest out of the Middle East and, of course, Washington, D.C. New details as they come in right here at the Live Desk and online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. Angela, thank you. And while the Biden administration says it still supports Israel, President Biden's latest shift on the issue is drawing criticism from all sides. At National Desk's Kayla Gaskins continues our coverage. On Sunday, Israel announcing it's pulling out troops from southern Gaza, leaving just one brigade in place. The reason for this drawback remains unclear. I presume this is a tactical decision by the IDF. The move comes days after President Biden demanded a ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war and improvements to the humanitarian situation in Gaza during a phone call with Israeli leader Benjamin Netanyahu. Biden telling Netanyahu U.S. aid was on the line if changes were not made by Israel. It's the first time Biden leveraged aid like this. The shift deeply dividing Democrats. The president and the White House have yet to lay out what consequences they have and they want to impose. And we have had a situation where for months 
Uh, the president has made requests to the Netanyahu government. They have ignored those requests. Nancy Pelosi and 30 other Democrats now urging Biden to reconsider sending already authorized weapons reinforcements to Israel. Delaware Democrat Senator Chris Coons attempting to clarify the U.S. isn't wavering in supporting Israel. And that we make it clear we will defend Israel. Meanwhile, the families of those still being held hostage by Hamas concerned Biden's demand for a ceasefire didn't make a pause in fighting contingent on their loved ones release. We want our people back, period. I feel that our governments have failed and I feel that all the parties at the table have failed. Biden's recent shift seen by some as the president caving to the political pressure of ceasefire protesters. Four children are killed every hour in Gaza. Who came out in hundreds of thousands to make their discontent heard during important primaries. And as the president attempts to walk this political tightrope, he appears to be angering many and pleasing few, ringing alarm bells for his chances of re-election. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins. And we're also following rising tensions from pro-Palestinian activists here in the U.S. This is video of a speaker at a rally in Dearborn, Michigan, a district held by progressive Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. The crowd can be heard yelling, death to America, and the speaker refers to President Biden as Genocide Joe and calls for the death to Israel. This morning, lawmakers under immense pressure on Capitol Hill as they return from a two-week recess. A bunch on the agenda in both the House and the Senate. And to break it all down, the National Desk's Christine Frizzell joins us. Live from Capitol Hill. Good morning to you, Christine. What can we expect? Well, first and foremost, Jan, a lot of drama. The Senate is set to take up the impeachment of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. This is essentially about the Biden administration's border policies, which Republicans say have threatened U.S. national security. Expect this Wednesday to see 11 House Republican impeachment managers formally march across the Capitol to deliver two articles of impeachment to the Senate. The Senate, of course, run by Democrats, who are expected to wrap the trial up quickly if they even hold a trial. There is also the issue of Mike Johnson's speakership. Conservative Republican Marjorie Taylor Greene has indicated she plans to hold a vote to remove him after he worked with Democrats to pass a budget. There's the matter of funding for Ukraine and Israel, the reauthorization of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, known as FISA, and whether the Senate will follow the House in voting to ban TikTok if the parent company ByteDance, a Chinese company, doesn't sell to an American company. There are also some immediate needs from Baltimore after the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed. President Biden told Maryland Governor Westmore the nation stands behind him. But as far as the nation's dollars, that's going to be up to Congress. All, um, as, by the way, a, a pretty competitive Senate race is playing out in the state. I'm Christine Prezout reporting for the National Desk. Christine, thank you very much. New video of the U.S. showing solidarity with our allies in the South China Sea, holding joint military drills with Australia, Japan, and the Philippines. The drill aimed to show their commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific, an area with several islands that China has tried to claim as its own territory. Live deaths were tracking major outages in Colorado after high winds knocked out power for hundreds of thousands of people. At one point, more than 300,000 were in the dark. Now, we just updated these numbers for you as well. Things are very much improved here. Right now, 61,000 are reporting outages across the state. And take a look at this brand new video just into the live desk overnight from Littleton, Colorado, capturing huge pine trees. You see they're toppled over and on Sunday, top wind gusts reached between 80 and 95 miles per hour in some areas. And now to a live look at the National Desk Radar as we look ahead to threats spanning over parts of Texas. You can see them kind of moving right there to Arkansas and to Tennessee. You can see that band of storms moving over Middle Tennessee later this morning. Could impact Jan, of course, the eclipse today. Yeah, and unfortunately, we know that the severe weather threat is going to impact millions hoping to get a glimpse of that once in a generation view of the total eclipse. How many people do we think are going to be really disappointed right now, Angela? There could be millions of people because that storm is just simply so, it's, it's moving. You saw it moving across uh, the radar there, so it cl could cloud out a number of people's views. But right now, Jen, we're taking a live look over, he's over Dallas, Texas, where, as you said, lots of people are looking forward to that total solar eclipse later today. It starts at around 12.23 p.m. with just under four minutes of totality from 1.40 to 1.44 p.m. local time. Even if the storm holds off forecasters 
officers predict clouds could once again hinder today's view. The main threat today will be large hail, uh, though tornadoes may also be possible in some cases. An estimated 31 million people live in part of totality spanning over 15 states, as well as parts of Mexico and also parts of Canada. Our national desk partners in Dayton, Ohio, WKEF, spoke with one family who drove hours to see the once-in-a-lifetime event. This might be our last chance, you know, to see it as a family. So, you know, who knows we'll, we'll, where we'll be when the next one happens. It's relatively close to home, so it makes it easy to come out and, and see it. And again, here's a look at today's severe weather threat. Texas is likely to have the heaviest cloud cover. Uh, that severe weather is forecast around the same time as the eclipse in some parts. The good news here, eclipse watchers who get clouded or even rained out can watch our live coverage today on the nationaldesk.com. Tune in between 1 and 4 p.m. Eastern as we track the eclipse from coast to coast. Again, that's online at the nationaldesk.com. Good news, though. Um, we have her in custody and you do? Oh my gosh. Where's my son? Caught on camera. That emotional moment a father learned his four year old son was found safe and alive. Yesterday's Amber Alert in Washington State canceled after police found the boy with his mother who did not have legal custody. Authorities say she went to his grandparents' house and took him in the middle of the night. They say she recently got out of prison and made threats to harm the boy and herself. Hours later, police spotted her vehicle and arrested her. The boy was also there. He was not harmed. And now this morning, he's back with his dad. New information about an arson at the Vermont office of Senator Bernie Sanders. Burlington police did arrest a 35-year-old man from California. The arrest was made hours after police released these surveillance images. They say the suspect set fire to the building on Friday. No one was injured. New signs of progress to clean up the Baltimore Harbor after the deadly bridge collapse. Salvage crews began removing containers from the deck of the cargo ship that crashed into the bridge. Workers are also removing parts of the bridge that fell onto that ship. Maryland Governor Wes Moore said he hopes they can get the harbor running as normal again by the end of May. Ahead this morning, border crisis, new illegal entries caught on camera as more U.S. cities are strained from the surge of migrants. And right here at the live desk, the latest after a deadly weekend shooting near downtown Miami, two dead and half a dozen injured. We're going to have the details coming up in 90 seconds. And victims are recovering this morning after a deadly weekend shooting at a martini bar inside a busy shopping center in downtown Miami on Saturday. Police say the shooter was taken out by officers at the scene. Sadly, though, we've learned that the other person killed was the head security guard at Durrell's martini bar.
Looking at him, George Castellanos, only 23 years old. Police say two patrons apparently got into some sort of an argument. He was shot twice while trying to break up that fight. He leaves behind a girlfriend and his one-year-old daughter. Six others were also shot, uh, including a police officer and the owner of that martini bar. Thankfully, though, all those victims are expected to survive. Angela, thank you. A lot of folks are headed out to areas across Texas to watch today's total eclipse. Concan in Uvalde County is one of the first cities that will experience the historic event. National Desk's Mandy Noel is live from that location for us this morning. Good morning to you, Mandy. What are you seeing so far? And I'm really hoping the weather holds off for you guys so you guys get a good view. Oh, man, we're hoping so, too. So, Concan, let me just tell you a little about it. It's a small town here in Texas. It's right on the Frio River. You got crystal clear, beautiful water. It's a great place. So I've talked with people who have been planning this trip for this eclipse for like eight years. And I said, you know, are you guys gonna be upset if it's cloudy? And they were like, no, it's the experience. They've come together with their friends, in some case, their family members, their kids. It's a once in a lifetime experience. And the eclipse, is, you know, they're all hoping to see it, but I think it's that sense of togetherness um, that people are really excited for, just getting to experience this. And, you know, it's funny because the crew, we were sitting out on the river last night and it was cl just clear skies. We could see the stars. It was so beautiful. And we're not seeing any of that now, that oh, the no. town is kind of starting to slowly wake up here in Concan. Um, I know, I know, but you know what? It's all right because it's, it's, it's the experience. It's still going to get dark. So right at 1.30 and where we are is the path of totality. So for just under four and a half minutes, we are going to get to experience the total solar eclipse. Even if we can't see the sun, it's still going to get dark the birds will stop singing and chirping and it's kind <laughs> of like the world's lights gonna yeah. just turn off for a couple minutes all right so you <laughs> you did yeah. see some clear skies <laughs> last night because you got to see the stars what are you hearing about the forecast for today from local meteorologists there Well, actually, our chief meteorologist for my home station, um, Chris Suchan, who wanted to tell me hello oh, for you. He I says he knows you. I used to work with your Chris. Friends, Dan. Yeah, I love him. Um, yeah. He's. It says he. That's what he. Oh, we got a cameo. <laughs> Chris, what's up? Oh my Hi, goodness. Jam. Yeah, she's that. like, I it's love like Chris. I used to work with him like 20 years ago. So no funny? kidding. Literally 20 years ago. She said it's like old times. Yeah, it, it really is like old times here. Let me just add <laughs> that uh, we may get breaks of some sun or even some filtered sun. We wouldn't be able to see the corona if that. Even if we do actually get to see some breakthrough. Uh, but as you pointed out beautifully here, this is your chance to see a night sky in the middle of the afternoon. Yeah. And with the cloud cover, if it's high clouds, we won't see the bright stars and planets, which are possible. Parts of the path of totality, like up in the main, they'll get that for sure. Yeah. But, but as you said, there's a lot of experience. The temperature drop, the birds get quiet. Yeah, you know. and so we've got like a temperature gauge out here that we'll be able to kind of follow all of that. And just scientists from all over the world are in places like Concan, Texas. Mm -hmm. There's a bat cave close by, which is just kind of random, but it's yeah. super interesting. Yeah. That is. But they're going to be studying the bats and their reaction in the middle of the eclipse to see what, like, how it affects them, so, which is really interesting. Right. All right, Chris, uh, I know. Great to see you both, by the way. I mean, you don't, you haven't changed at all, Chris. You're still the same, same <laughs> guy. And I love it. Uh, she you says both. you haven't changed at all. Oh. <laughs> still a nerd. Still, exactly. Still you took it right out of my mouth. Still a nerd. <laughs> oh, thanks, Dan. You guys have a great day, and I think we'll see you again soon. All so, right. We'll check you. in with you throughout the morning. Thank you, guys. And we're checking to see if Friday's jobs numbers could be revised down after that happened with 12 of the past 14 reports. On Friday, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported 303,000 workers hired last month, but the job gains have largely gone to foreign-born workers, both legal and illegal immigrants. From February 2020 to this past March, the number of migrant workers grew to 3.4 million, while the number of U.S.-born workers declined by 78,000 over the same period. And we do continue to follow the border crisis with more signs that migrants are trying to enter the U.S. illegally. The National Desk's Kayla Gaskins reports. New video from the southern border shows a crowd of migrants cutting razor wire to enter Texas illegally under the cover of night. 
The video reportedly taken this past week from the Mexican side of the border in Ciudad Juarez. Some migrants appear to make it through, others pushed back by Texas forces. The installation of this razor wire along the border is central to an ongoing federal legal battle between Texas and the U.S. Justice Department. Illegal immigration into Texas has gone down 72 percent because of the resistance that we've put up. It's gone up, however, uh, in the other border states. Meanwhile, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas calling Abbott's effort ineffective when talking to reporters on Friday. Mayorkas accusing Texas of purposefully trying to create disorder at the border. Abbott says they're simply cleaning up a mess made by Washington. Joe Biden has uh, created this open border policy that has allowed illegal immigrants into our country uh, to uh, appeal to and to appease uh, the far leftists uh, in the Democrat Party. Look, there is a challenge at the border, right? Our immigration system has been broken for decades before, even before this president became president, obviously, three years, more than three years ago. Last week, Texas arresting 214 migrants involved in a riot at the border on March 21st. As Texas cracks down, fellow border states like California are experiencing an uptick in illegal crossings. It used to be in previous administrations uh, in Washington, Washington, D.C., when people would come across the country illegally, they would try to avoid Border Patrol. Now they run to the Border Patrol. They know all the right questions to ask and statements to make to, to ask for asylum. This comes as more and more voters see immigration problems impacting other big issues like crime, drugs, national spending, and national security, making immigration the number one issue for most voters as they look ahead to November's elections in Washington. I'm Kayla Gaskins. New video of the Royal Bahamas Defense Forces arresting 257 Haitian migrants in a large-scale migrant smuggling operation. Crews intercepted their boat 24 miles south of the Bahamas, and now immigration authorities are processing the migrants. The Bahamas launched an operation last month to deter illegal immigration. And an Ozempic-like drug used to treat diabetes showed early potential in the slowing of the progression of Parkinson's disease. Results from a mid-stage trial found that Lixumia reduced the worsening of tremors and slowness of movement after 12 months in patients in an early stage of the disease. Researchers say the findings are encouraging to the 90,000 patients diagnosed in the U.S. each year. And right here at the Live Desk, an investigation into Do Boeing after another major failure of their 737 MAX fleet. We're going to have the details coming up in 90 seconds. I don't think so. I think it's 
U.S. airline regulators have launched an investigation into Boeing after an engine cover flew off during takeoff and hit the wing flap. Now, here's really some stunning video we have to show you. You can see it right back here. Parts of the plane are actually flying off as the plane starts to take off. 135 passengers were on that flight that took off from Denver, headed to Javi Airport in Houston on Sunday. After the incident, the plane turned around and landed safely back in Denver. Thankfully, no injuries, though, were reported the FAA is also investigating several other recent Boeing issues that could cost the company big money, including a criminal investigation into an incident back in January when a door plug panel tore off an Alaska Airlines 737 MAX 9 jet. Angela, thank you very much. A Powerball player in Oregon is waking up a billionaire this morning after matching all six numbers to win the $1.3 billion jackpot. The Oregon Lottery says the lucky ticket holder has not come forward yet. The winner has a year to claim it. Ahead in our next half hour, closing the gap. Former President Trump hauling in a historic amount of cash, spelling trouble for President Biden's re-election bid. Also, weather threats, severe storms, putting millions in the South on alert, complicating viewing conditions for excited eclipse watchers. First, here's a look at America's news and weather where you live. I'm meteorologist Emily Santa. And let's take a look at the Northeast for highs for today. Mostly in Maine and New Hampshire and Massachusetts, we're looking at low 50s, 47 up in Caribou, Maine for the solar eclipse. 70s over in New York, we're looking around 75 for Syracuse, 72 for Buffalo, 75 for New York City. We'll start to see some clouds come into New York. Temperatures still into the 50s, but by solar eclipse time, we're looking at best views possible in northern Vermont, New Hampshire, and over in Maine. I'm Chief Meteorologist Gerard Bailey. Here's a look at your weather across the Mid-Atlantic region. We're looking at mostly clear skies through the time of the eclipse. Very good news. We'll be able to see most of what's going on. There will be some pockets of clouds. We're talking 30 to perhaps 50% coverage. A few showers move through after the fact, but better rain chances coming as we head later into the week. Temperatures are going to soar this week a little bit here. We'll likely hit the 60s no problem on Monday. 70s on tap for Tuesday. I'm meteorologist Vitas Reed. Here's a look at your southeast forecast highs. We're looking at 75 Nashville, 77 in Raleigh, 80 Birmingham, 85 in Tampa, 77 in West Palm. We do have a few scattered showers that is going to kind of give a hard time for folks across Tennessee, up around northern uh, Georgia for the viewing of the eclipse down over parts of uh, Mississippi and ten, uh, eastern Texas. But over southern Georgia and also along the Carolinas, it looks pretty good through the afternoon. Just a few high clouds over, clouds over Florida. Looks like we'll get that front pushing through late week. Well, a very good Monday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael. A little wet weather across the northern plains for the day today. The eclipse will be happening. Path of totality going about right where my hand is. And we've got some pretty decent weather across the Midwest to check out the total solar eclipse happening today. Tomorrow, rain starts moving in a little bit more. The plains, pretty quiet for the day tomorrow. But more rain will be filling in for the Ohio Valley heading into your Wednesday. Good Monday morning. I'm meteorologist Joe DiCarlo. Look at our forecast across the region. Solar eclipse day. We'll start with low-level clouds across Texas. More clear skies, though, Oklahoma and Arkansas. So here's the eclipse time frame around 1, 1.30 to 2. We will have mainly cloudy conditions across South Texas. Some breaks in the clouds as you head towards North Texas and uh, partly sunny skies throughout Arkansas. After the eclipse, it's severe weather chances, especially across North Texas and Southern Oklahoma. All modes of severe weather will be possible. Good morning, I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. Temperatures gradually warming up again from California up into the Pacific Northwest. But as we move from temperatures into an incoming storm, it is a warm front and we've got rain at times with mountain snow tracking into the Pacific Northwest with scattered rain showers in the afternoon for much of the mountain areas of the Southwest. That's the scene from here.
The National Desk, America's News Now. Now on the National Desk, America's News Now, back to work. Right now in Washington, Congress facing a laundry list of priorities that are putting the House Speaker's position at risk. Closing the gap. Former President Trump hauling in record donations as the Republican Party focuses on taking back the White House. Also, I think everyone should, should experience an eclipse at least once in their life, a total eclipse. It's, it's like I said, it's, it's just an amazing astronomical event. Eclipse across America, a lot of excitement today, but those eclipse expectations are at risk by some dangerous weather. Thanks for joining us. You are watching The National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Jean Jeffcoat. It is Monday, April 8th, and the wait is just about over with some visibility of the eclipse starting in just hours from now. Angela Brown at the live desk tracking its path and the weather problems already getting in the way. Or some. Good morning to you. And good morning, Jan. More than 31 million Americans are on the path of today's solar eclipse, including uh, those in Dallas, Texas. You see right here behind me, the path though highlighted to my left, right over here spans across 15 U.S. states and also parts of Canada and also Mexico. Now today's event really is a once in a lifetime experience for so many people, but the view could be blocked by storm clouds in some areas. Texas is likely to have the heaviest cloud cover with severe weather forecasted for around eclipse time in some parts. Now here's a look at the path of totality. The eclipse will begin in Mexico around 11.07 a.m. local time and will cross over into Texas about 1.27 p.m. and will end in Maine around 3.35. Officials in cities in that direct path are issuing warnings here ahead of the massive amounts of eclipse tourists that arrived over the weekend. Our National Desk partners in Tulsa, Oklahoma spoke with troopers with the Oklahoma Highway Patrol. Don't drive and take pictures with your cell phone. We respectfully request that you don't stop uh, on the sides of the roads with the infrastructure, um, with one lane roads, it's going to be difficult getting in and getting out. And a live look at the National Desk Radar for you this week as well, where you can, you're going to see those band of storms right there heading over middle Tennessee. Again, the most cloud cover expected in the Dallas, Texas region. The good news here, Eclipse watchers, if you get clouded or even rained out, you can watch our live coverage today on the nationaldesk.com. Tune in between 1 and 4 p.m. Eastern as we track the eclipse from coast to coast. Again, that's online at the nationaldesk.com. Angela, thank you. Today, Congress returns to Capitol Hill from Easter recess, and leaders are laying out their priorities. First up, Mike Johnson's position as House Speaker at risk over talks about future aid to Ukraine. This week, he is expected to release his own proposals on money for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Johnson said the funding may be split into separate packages and is being pressured by House and Senate Republicans to use leverage to strengthen border security. What we have is the ability to say you don't get money for your priorities unless you do what the American people need you to do. And unfortunately, whether it's Mitch McConnell or unfortunately too many House Republicans, there's been an unwillingness from our leadership to use that leverage. On Wednesday, House impeachment managers are set to deliver the articles of impeachment against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to the Senate. Back in February, Mayorkas became the first cabinet secretary to be impeached in 150 years, but Democratic senators are expected to dismiss or even delay the trial. And this week, Congress will also consider the approval and conditions for funds to rebuild the key bridge in Baltimore after its collapse. The House Freedom Caucus has called on the Biden administration to lift its pause on approvals for natural gas export projects before discussing funding. Former President Trump shattering his campaign fundraising records over the weekend. The Republican National Committee said Trump hauled in more than $50 million during an event in Palm Beach, Florida. We are going to spend every single dollar that we raise on two key critical core missions for the RNC, which are getting out the vote and protecting the ballot. And uh, we're going to make sure that we are focusing on the battleground states and districts where we need to be competitive and making sure that every dollar that we raise is going to be putting lead on target. 
The Biden campaign says it has more than $192 million on hand compared to Trump's $93 million. Later this week, Trump is traveling to Atlanta, where the RNC is holding a similar fundraising event. Meantime, Democrats threatening the Republican House majority and the details of their strategy now being revealed. The House Majority PAC, which is aligned with House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, said it plans to spend $186 million on television and digital ads for this November's elections. Democrats need to flip just four seats, and the group said it's spending most of that money in vulnerable Republican districts in New York and California. This morning, Republicans in Ohio are warning that President Biden's name may not appear on the presidential ballot there in November. National Desk's Christine Frizzell joins us live from Capitol Hill with more on this. And what's behind this, Christine? Yeah, this is pretty interesting, Jan. The state deadline to certify a presidential candidate there is 90 days before the general election, which this year is on November 5th. That puts the deadline on August 7th, but the official nominating convention for Democrats is not scheduled to convene until August 19th. So what can be done? Well, two things. Either the DNC, which has had the convention center and agenda set for months now, would have to move up its convention or the Ohio General Assembly would need to vote on creating an exception to this rule. It's hard to imagine that happening either since the Republican Party controls offices of the governor, secretary of state, and both chambers of the state legislature. The last time a Democrat won Ohio in a presidential election was Barack Obama in both uh, 2008 and 2012. The Biden campaign insists, though, they're confident Joe Biden's name will appear on the ballot in all 50 states. But I would say you might want to keep your eye on this space. I'm Christine Frizzell reporting for the National Desk. And right here at the live desk, former President Donald Trump making a major announcement today regarding his stance on abortion access. What we just found out coming up in 90 seconds. The entire country is preparing for the total solar eclipse, and the state of Texas is taking in the brunt of visitors at this point. The National Desk's Fred Cantu is live at the Long Center in Austin to tell us what sky gazers can expect and how the city is really preparing for today's big event. What are you seeing right now, Fred? Are, are you seeing some cloud coverage there? Because I know I talked to somebody uh, earlier also in the state of Texas who said there was it was clear skies last night. They could see all the stars, but not so much this morning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we had some great weather uh, over the weekend, but unfortunately, we do have the clouds uh, rolling in uh, or right now above us. I see a few breaks. Maybe they'll be lucky today and see some uh, uh, something in between the clouds. But unfortunately, the forecast here is for mostly cloudy weather. But we are lucky. I mean, here uh, in the capital city of Texas, we have a minute and 44 seconds of totality today. So hopefully someone will be able to get a glimpse out here. And, but just in case, a lot of the parks and uh, libraries here are going to be open. They're going to have eclipse activities, primarily to keep people off the roads and and and, uh, and, and avoid any of the traffic snarls that uh, are bound to happen with this many people in town. And also, there's concern about uh, snarls in 
phone traffic here. Uh, we had our folks from the emergency management talking uh, to us about uh, when we get this many people together, the system will bog down. That means folks can't call 911. They're suggesting texting 911 instead in an emergency that they'll have better uh, success with their, their phone calls. But again, our peak time is supposed to be at 1.36 this afternoon here in Austin. We're hoping for a bit of a clearing sky, and I certainly wish well to anyone else who wants to see the uh, eclipse today. My daughter got to see it in 2017. She called it life-changing. We're reporting live in Austin, Brett Cantu for the National Desk. And breaking right here at the live desk, the battle over abortion access turning out to be a major player as we know in the race for the White House. In just the last hour, former President Donald Trump laid out his plans really for the future of that national debate. The former president announcing on Truth Social that he believes states should hold the power to make the call either by voter legislation. He also said he believes in preserving the availability of IVF treatment for American families. This marks a pivotal moment in the 2024 presidential race as Democrats make abortion central to their case against the former president. Now we're gonna go through this and bring you more details as it comes in right here at the live desk. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. We have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From protecting eyes to preparing pets, the Pulse of America is getting you ready for today's solar eclipse. And we start with a lot of folks scrambling to get the best view possible. I just, I came in here, I saw the prepare for the eclipse on the 8th, there's a sign up there, and I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled. I saw my brother, and I can't wait. She's one of thousands of people expected to travel here, all to catch a view. Eclipse chasers Lori and Robert Paz came all the way from California. Yeah, I think everyone should should experience an eclipse at least once in their life, a total eclipse. It's, it's like I said, it's, it's just an amazing astronomical event. The eclipse bringing families together, like Kate McKay's. We have family flying in from um, other parts of the country, too, to come up and, and see it. And Phyllis Browns. Her son organized a family reunion inviting everyone. Um, it's turned out quite a few people are joining us here for the eclipse. And of course, we don't know that we'll be able to see the sun because it's Rochester, but we'll be out on Lake Ontario, east of Rochester, and uh, it'll be fun no matter what. If you look at the sun, even just for a couple seconds, you actually may have some damage to the back of the eye that you might not know about for a little while. Local optometrist Dr. Zachary Long explains why looking at an eclipse can lead to serious health concerns. The sun coming around is actually having that UV damage. That UV damage can get centered in the very back of the eye in our central vision spot. Well, if that happens, you might lose vision forever. He also mentioned that there are some people more susceptible to UV damage. A child has a very clear lens inside the eye, and that lens is going to focus all of that damage to the very back of the eye. And unfortunately, it's a one and done. And you only have one set of eyeballs, so make sure that you take care of them. The main way to safely see the solar eclipse is with special glasses. You're going to notice that they're a lot darker than sunglasses, and so you can't really see out of them. And so the whole idea behind wearing these is we've got solar filters in here, and so those solar filters are going to protect the eye. don't have concrete answers. Because while Dr. Gingrich knows just about everything there is to know about pets, no one really knows what these do to them. There's very little scientific research behind animal behavior and eclipses. Of course, we've had eclipses before, not quite to the totality we're expecting this time around in a long time. But still, that leads Dr. Gingrich to predict. I would not be overly concerned about this eclipse. But she admits. You know your animal more than the veterinarian you come to. Which means if you have a pet that in the past has environmental triggers like fireworks or storms or whatever it may be, then your animal might be a little more sensitive to the eclipse's consequences. Do your best in making them feel as comfortable as you think they would want to be. Join us for Eclipse Across America, a live stream from 1 to 4 p.m. Eastern today as we track the eclipse from coast to coast. We have coverage with more than 50 live locations, dozens of local meteorologists and NASA experts. We'll be streaming on the nationaldesk.com.
A new government study shows 25% of American adults still have lingering issues after COVID, including blood clots, which can turn deadly. So what are the signs you need to watch out for, and is there anything you can do to prevent it? Well, joining us now to discuss is CEO of MedHelp Clinics, Dr. Jordan Vaughn. Good morning to you. Dr. Good Vaughn, morning. Great to see you. Now, this recently came back into the headlines with Colorado Congresswoman Lauren Boebert, who underwent surgery, as we know, last Tuesday to remove uh, a blood clot and was subsequently diagnosed with May Therner syndrome. First, tell us what this condition is and is there a link to these blood clots and COVID? Yeah, so May, May Therner is basically a uh, area of the body, especially in the pelvic venous area, that, that has the iliac vein lacking good venous return. And when that happens, you have the more uh, likelihood that somebody is going to have venous stasis or lack of vein or blood movement. And you combine that with things like a hypercoagulable state or damage to the inside of the vessels, which both of which COVID does. And you kind of have, you meet all the criteria, the three criteria we usually have to produce blood clots, lack of blood movement, hypercoagulability, and damage to the vessel. How does May Therner syndrome put more pressure on the veins and arteries to increase the chance of a blood clot forming? And how does COVID increase that risk? So May Therner is, uh, is a better name is actually what we call iliac vein compression. So the iliac vein is a vein in your pelvis and that vein is responsible. It's kind of the highway out of your pelvis for the used blood, your venous blood. And when that gets compressed or basically has the artery above it smashing down on it against your uh, ver vertebrae, your spine, you limit the amount of flow. Imagine it kind of like uh, pressing down on a hose and uh, limiting the amount of, of total volume that can get back to your heart easily. So what are the symptoms and how can this be prevented? So most of these people, especially in the post-COVID state, can have a lot of leg heaviness. They can also have leg swelling. Pre predominant area for this iliac vein to be co uh, compressed is on the left side. So given that, a lot of times they definitely have symptoms that are worse on the left or on the right. The other interesting thing is once you block the highway out of the pelvis, what happens is your body is going to still look for back roads and those back roads are going to be all these other venous collaterals. Those collaterals can go over your bladder, over your uterus, over your GI tract, over your uh, sacral spine. So in a sense, it can cause increased urinary frequency, heavy menstrual cycles or pelvic pain. It can cause hemorrhoids or GI upset. It can also cause sacral back pain, back pain in your tailbone. So are you seeing these types of clots in your patients who've had COVID? I am, and in fact, a lot of it I am seeing before the clots actually develop. A lot of them come to me after the clots, but a lot of them come initially with the symptoms, and at least they're active enough so they can continue to move beyond the compression. But for the most part, when they're moving, they feel like they are not feeling the same at all anymore. A lot of the people that I see are very active, very slender, uh, almost runners, ultra marathon type people. And what they tell me is all of a sudden, I, I can't run at all without my legs feeling extremely heavy and my heart beating very fast and me feeling short of breath. The other thing that's interesting is that if you don't get good venous return to your heart, your heart isn't gonna have the amount of blood to pump forward. And so in that sense, a lot of these symptoms can also be cardiac in terms of high heart rate out of proportion to what they're exerting, or it can be shortness of breath. Women between the ages of 20 and 45 who have given birth are more likely, as we know, to have May Therner syndrome. Bobert, for instance, has four children. So how common is this and who else is at risk? So interestingly enough, prior to uh, COVID, I would say this was a predominantly just women's issue. And in fact, that's what's so interesting in my practice. Prior to this, it would have been 99% women that had any issues with May Therner. But now about 40% of the people I see are men, which is wow. again, showing me that all of a sudden there's a new thing that is mixing into the, the pathology, which is COVID. Again, women have progesterone, estrogen, uteruses, and babies, which are usually the way that you have trauma or issues with this iliac vein uh, architecture in the pelvis. But men and women equally get COVID and equally get vaccinated. And given that the spike protein damages the endothelium and makes your blood more hypercoagulable, if you have a May Therner type anatomy, it is more likely that you might suffer from this. What other types of lingering conditions uh, have you seen emerge since COVID that you didn't see prior? A lot of it can be the pulmonary vasculature is another area with a lot of veins and arteries. And given that, uh, again, COVID is a vascular disease and the spike protein damages the small vessels, 
uh, the small vessels in your lungs are responsible for getting oxygen to your tissues. And so if you don't get oxygen to your tissues, uh, in a sense, uh, you're not only uh, not going to really operate right, but you're going to feel very fatigued. And, you know, the most common areas of that is brain fog, shortness of breath. And the other thing we would cause is post-exertional malaise. It is as if you do something and uh, almost feel out of proportion to how you feel the next day, like you don't really recover well. It's fascinating what we're learning post-COVID right now. Uh, CEO of MedHelp Clinics, Dr. Jordan Vaughn. We certainly appreciate uh, you joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And right here at the live desk, we continue our coverage as we near that once in a lifetime view of a total solar eclipse where some stargazers could get their views blocked coming up in 90 seconds. Tonight, the big dance will end with the NCAA Men's College Basketball Championship. The Purdue Boilermakers are trying to stop the Connecticut Huskies who are searching for a back-to-back -back title at 9.20 p.m. Eastern. And on the women's side, the South Carolina Gamecocks back on top of the college basketball world. Yesterday, the South Carolina women's team did wrap up their perfect 3-0 season, beating Iowa and Caitlin Clark 75-87. Utilize this opportunity to thank Caitlin for what she's done for women's basketball. Like her, her shoulders were heavy and getting a lot of eyeballs on our game. I think anytime somebody like Coach Daly is able to recognize you and what you did for the game is, is pretty special. And obviously she's somebody I, you know, respect so much. Iowa's Caitlin Clark has declared for the WNBA draft and is expected to be the first overall pick this season, she did set the all-time scoring record across both men's and women's college basketball. And we are counting down to today's total solar eclipse set to cross over more than a dozen U.S. states. You can see the map here, parts of Canada and also Mexico. But the view could be blocked out by storm clouds in some areas. Texas is likely to have the heaviest cloud cover with severe weather forecasted for around eclipse time, which is about 1.40 this afternoon. The eclipse will begin in Mexico around 11.07. 7 a.m. local time and will cross over into Texas around 127 Central, ending in Maine at around 335 Eastern. We'll have more eclipse coverage throughout the morning, of course, right here at the live desk, and we'll stream it live when it happens this afternoon on the nationaldesk.com. For now, though, we leave you with this look at America's news and weather now where you live. I'm meteorologist Emily Santa and let's take a look at the northeast for highs for today. Mostly in Maine and New Hampshire and Massachusetts, we're looking at low 50s, 47 up in Caribou, Maine for the solar eclipse. 70s over in New York, we're looking around 75 for Syracuse, 72 for Buffalo, 75 for New York City. We'll start to see some clouds come into New York. Temperature still into the 50s, but by solar eclipse time, we're looking at best views possible in northern Vermont, New Hampshire and over in Maine.
I'm Chief Meteorologist Gerard Bailey. Here's a look at your weather across the Mid-Atlantic region. We're looking at mostly clear skies through the time of the eclipse. Very good news. We'll be able to see most of what's going on. There will be some pockets of clouds. We're talking 30 to perhaps 50% coverage. A few showers move through after the fact, but better rain chances coming as we head later into the week. Temperatures are going to soar this week a little bit here. We'll likely hit the 60s no problem on Monday. 70s on tap for Tuesday. I'm meteorologist Vitas Reed. Here's a look at your southeast forecast highs. We're looking at 75 Nashville, 77 in Raleigh, 80 Birmingham, 85 in Tampa, 77 in West Palm. We do have a few scattered showers that is going to kind of give a hard time for folks across Tennessee, up around northern uh, Georgia for the viewing of the eclipse down over parts of uh, Mississippi and ten, uh, eastern Texas. But over southern Georgia and also along the Carolinas, it looks pretty good through the afternoon. Just a few high clouds over, clouds over Florida. Looks like we'll get that front pushing through late week. Well, a very good Monday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael. A little wet weather across the northern plains for the day today. The eclipse will be happening. Path of totality going about right where my hand is. And we've got some pretty decent weather across the Midwest to check out the total solar eclipse happening today. Tomorrow, rain starts moving in a little bit more. The plains, pretty quiet for the day tomorrow. But more rain will be filling in for the Ohio Valley heading into your Wednesday. Good Monday morning. I'm meteorologist Joe DiCarlo. Look at our forecast across the region. Solar eclipse day. We'll start with low-level clouds across Texas. More clear skies though, Oklahoma and Arkansas. So here's the eclipse time frame around 1, 1.30 to 2. We will have mainly cloudy conditions across South Texas. Some breaks in the clouds as you head towards North Texas and uh, partly sunny skies throughout Arkansas. After the eclipse, it's severe weather chances, especially across North Texas and Southern Oklahoma. All modes of severe weather will be possible. Good morning, I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. Temperatures gradually warming up again from California up into the Pacific Northwest. But as we move from temperatures into an incoming storm, it is a warm front and we've got rain at times with mountain snow tracking into the Pacific Northwest with scattered rain showers in the afternoon for much of the mountain areas of the Southwest. That's the scene from here. The National Desk, America's News Now. Shifting strategy. One goal is to bring the hostages home, and the other goal is to fully eliminate the Hamas. Israel pulling troops from Gaza with new hostage talks underway, now six months since the deadly Hamas terror attack. Frustrating forecast. Several areas already dealing with damage and outages as more storms are predicted along the heartland today, threatening to block the solar eclipse. 
being in the middle of the day and suddenly the lights just go down like it's dusk, right? And then crickets start singing because they think it's nighttime. Millions across the U.S. are ready for the solar show. Where and when you can catch the moon pass across the sun. Tearful reunion. Good news, though. Um, we have her in custody. And... <laughs> you do? Oh, my gosh. Where's my son? The emotional end to an Amber Alert caught on camera. And March Madness. Perfection with a touch of sweet redemption. It's the men's turn tonight after the women's championship was just clinched. Live from the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jan Jeffcoat. It is Monday, April 8th, six months and one day since the Hamas terror attack on Israel. In that time, Israeli forces did begin a mission inside Gaza to destroy Hamas. But now they are pulling some troops from southern Gaza in order to prepare for a new operation. We do have team coverage with Kayla Gaskins covering the political pressure from the White House. But we start with Angela Brown at the live desk following concerns of a possible attack from Iran. Angela? And Jan, thousands made their way across the National Mall on Sunday calling for the release of hostages held by Hamas terrorists in Gaza since the deadly attack on October 7th, now more than six months ago. House Speaker Mike Johnson marking the memory of that massacre, saying in part right here, six months ago, Israelis suffered an unspeakable violence and terror. The slaughter of innocent lives by Hamas will forever be etched in the memory of our Jewish brothers and sisters. And I join Americans across the country who are mourning the loss of those tragically taken on October 7th. Right now, Israeli officials believe 99 Israeli hostages are still alive in Gaza. This morning, though, we are hearing from one man whose brother is one of them who is believed to be still alive. It is horrible um, that we have. I mean, zero um, insurance to know what, what, what is the future of our loved ones. They can die at any moment um, by the hands of the captives. And it's, it's, it's unbelievable to, to try and understand that. And now to a live look over the White House this morning. Top Biden officials are expressing concern that Iran may be planning to retaliate against Israel ahead of tomorrow's final day of Ramadan. Iran vowed to retaliate after last week's airstrikes that killed several senior officials. At the same time, the Israeli military announced Sunday they are pulling troops from southern Gaza and is preparing to go on the offensive on its northern border with Lebanon. Hezbollah terrorists have been exchanging fire with IDF forces there since October 8th. Meanwhile, hostage, hostage negotiations are underway in Cairo this week as well. We're keeping our eyes on all the latest out of the Middle East and Washington, D.C. as well. New details as they come in right here at the Live Desk and online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. Angela, thank you. And while the Biden administration says it supports Israel, President Biden's latest shift on the issue is drawing criticism from all sides. The National Desk's Kayla Gaskins continues our coverage. On Sunday, Israel announcing it's pulling out troops from southern Gaza, leaving just one brigade in place. The reason for this drawback remains unclear. I presume this is a tactical decision by the IDF. The move comes days after President Biden demanded a ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war and improvements to the humanitarian situation in Gaza during a phone call with Israeli leader Benjamin Netanyahu. Biden telling Netanyahu U.S. aid was on the line if changes were not made by Israel. It's the first time Biden leveraged aid like this. The shift deeply dividing Democrats. The president and the White House have yet to lay out what consequences they have and they want to impose. And we have had a situation where for months uh, the president has made requests to the Netanyahu government, they have ignored those requests. Nancy Pelosi and 30 other Democrats now urging Biden to reconsider sending already authorized weapons reinforcements to Israel. Delaware Democrat Senator Chris Coons attempting to clarify the U.S. isn't wavering in supporting Israel. And that we make it clear we will defend Israel. Meanwhile, the families of those still being held hostage by Hamas concerned Biden's demand for a ceasefire didn't make a pause in fighting contingent on their loved ones release. We want our people back. 
period. I feel that our governments have failed and I feel that all the parties at the table have failed. Biden's recent shift seen by some as the president caving to the political pressure of ceasefire protesters. Four children are killed every hour in Gaza. Who came out in hundreds of thousands to make their discontent heard during important primaries. And as the president attempts to walk this political tightrope, he appears to be angering many and pleasing few, ringing alarm bells for his chances of re-election. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins. We're also following rising tension from pro-Palestinian activists here in the U.S. This is video of speakers at a rally in Dearborn, Michigan, a district held by progressive Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. You can hear the crowd yelling death to America as one speaker refers to President Biden as Genocide Joe and calls for death to Israel. This morning, lawmakers under immense pressure on Capitol Hill as they return from a two-week recess. And there's a lot on the agenda in both the House and the Senate. To break it all down is the National Desk's Christine Frizzell joining us right now live from Capitol Hill. What can we expect, Christine? Well, first and foremost, Jan, a lot of drama. The Senate is set to take up the impeachment of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. This is essentially about the Biden administration's border policies, which Republicans say have threatened U.S. national security. So expect to see 11 House Republican impeachment managers formally march across the Capitol on Wednesday to deliver those two articles to the Senate. The Senate, of course, run by Democrats who are expected to wrap the trial up quickly, or that is if they even hold a trial at all. There is also the issue of uh, Mike Johnson's speakership. Conservative Republican Marjorie Taylor Greene has indicated she plans to hold a vote to remove him after he worked with Democrats to pass a budget. There's the matter of funding for Ukraine and Israel, the reauthorization of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, known as FISA, and whether the Senate will follow the House in voting to ban TikTok if the parent company ByteDance, a Chinese company, doesn't sell to an American company. And there are also some immediate needs from Baltimore after the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. President Biden told Maryland Governor Westmore the nation stands behind him. But as far as the nation's dollars, that is up to Congress. All as, by the way, a pretty competitive Senate race is playing out in the state. I'm Christine Frizzau reporting for the National Desk. All right, Christine, thanks so much. New video of the U.S. showing solidarity with our allies in the South China Sea, holding joint military drills with Australia, Japan, and the Philippines. The drill aimed to show their commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific, an area with several islands that China has tried to claim as its own territory. And here at the live desk, we're tracking major outages in Colorado after high winds knocked out power for hundreds of thousands of people. And at one point, more than 300,000 folks were in the dark. We just update these numbers for you as well. Things are much improved here. Right now, 61,000, over 61,000 are reporting outages across the state. Take a look, though, at this brand new video just into the live desk overnight from Littleton, Colorado, capturing a huge pine tree. Pines toppled over. Sunday, top wind gusts reached between 80 to 8, 95 miles per hour in some areas. And now to a live look at the National Desk Radar as we look ahead to threats spanning over parts of Texas to Arkansas, even Tennessee. You can see that band of storms there, Jan, moving over Middle Tennessee later this morning. Yeah, and unfortunately, Angela, we know today severe weather mm -hmm will impact millions. Hoping to get a glimpse of today's once-in-a-lifetime view of the total, total uh, solar eclipse there. So it seems like a lot of people could be disappointed, perhaps. Right. The cloud cover could actually obscure their view, and this is a large stretch of people we're talking about here. And right now, we're going to take you to Dallas, Texas first, where, as you said, Jan, a lot of people are looking forward to seeing that total solar eclipse later today. It starts at around 12, 23 p.m., just uh, f under four minutes of totality from 1.40 to 1.44 p.m. local time. Even if the storm holds off, forecasters predict cloud cover uh, could hinder today's view. The main threat, though, here will be large hail. Um, also, tornadoes could be possible as well. An estimated 31 million people live in the part of totality spanning over 15 states. You can see it right there, as well as parts of Mexico and Canada. Our national desk partners in Dayton, Ohio, WKEF, spoke with one family who drove hours to see this once-in-a-lifetime event. This might be our last chance, you know, to see it as a family. So, you know, who knows we'll, we'll, where we'll be when the next one happens. It's relatively close to home, so it makes it easy to come out and, and see it. 
And again, here's a look at today's severe weather threat. Texas is likely to have the heaviest cloud cover. That severe weather is forecast around eclipse time in some parts. The good news, though, eclipse watchers who get clouded or even rained out here can watch our live coverage today on the nationaldesk.com. Tune in between 1 and 4 p.m. Eastern as we track the eclipse from coast to coast. Again, that's online at the nationaldesk.com. A lot of folks are headed out to areas across Texas to watch today's total eclipse. Cancun in Uvalde County is one of the first cities that will experience this historic event. And the National Desk's Mandy Noel and Chief Meteorologist Chris Suchan are live from Cancun this morning. And Chris, we want to start with you. We know that weather could be a big issue today. Are you both there? Good morning to you both. There you are, Chris. Yes, we can hear you. This is like we old gotcha. times. Good, good morning, Jan. <laughs> good to see you. It is, for those that don't know, and many wouldn't know, but we worked together many moons ago uh, in North Carolina. That's right. Yeah. yeah, so we go a long ways back. Full circle. Full circle. I was so excited. He popped in last time and made a nice cameo. I was like, we got to get you in here. You guys need to talk. <laughs> So, Jan, to answer your question, uh, we now have first light here, and yes, we will be uh, in Texas, the first to get into the path of totality. Officially here at 1.30 in the afternoon, 13 seconds, totality begins. We have a deck of low clouds that have built in because it's humid now. The flow is coming in off the Gulf. But notice that it's, it's got thin spots. It's mm -hmm. not a real thick low-level cloud deck and that's important because it's quite possible that later this morning to midday we may scatter this low-level cloud deck into little fair weather cumulus clouds little puffy cumulus clouds we'll still have some high clouds overhead but if we can get partly sunny that will add to the experience might not be able to see the sun's corona right but you'd still be able to see the sun a hundred percent behind the moon. One yeah. of the cool things that I think you don't think about when you're talking about eclipse because people are so focused on the sun um, is that you kind of get a sunset just circling the horizon. It's one of the real neat, and for those that have great visibility, make sure you take that Golly. in. You look down because you're going to have sunrise, sunset colors, mm -hmm. 360 degrees around you on the horizon line. Oh, Which this. has got to be just breathtaking. Yeah. It's it is. Me goosebumps again. I saw that. I saw that in 2017 in Kansas City, yeah. and that was a real cool effect. M Mandy, I also like what you said earlier, too, and that is a lot of folks there are really, you know, they gathered, they came from all, all around, but they're there for the experience more than anything. So this is not really putting a, a huge damper on, on some of the festivities, uh, so to speak, that, that's going on there because they just, they just like that they're all together and coming together for this one big event. Yes, I mean, and there's scientists, NASA's out. There's where we are right now. I was just inside, and there were three carloads of astrologers, astronomers, astronomers. <laughs> Virgo, Gemini, no, Astro astrologers, astronomers, astronomers. <laughs> Thanks. Got to keep this we have, guy around. We have astronomers here. We have birders that are here because yeah. we have the golden cheek warbler. Yeah, with a which rare is an bird. endangered yeah. bird. So there's birders. There's people who just love the science involved with this, and so there's just thousands of people in this small city, and uh, the businesses have stayed open extra late. They're expecting yeah. just tons of people. But yeah, what you were saying is that. A lot of these people have been planning this trip for yeah. years. I think it's Jan, there's there's a real cool group that's here. Uh, uh, Air Force. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jan. There, there are Air Force pilots here with an uh, astronaut. They've come together after 20 years for a reunion from across the country here in Uvalde County for this experience. I love that. And I love the fact that right now you hear the birds and the background chirping, but at some point it's just going to all come to a standstill because, you know, a lot of the animals might think it's nighttime and time to go night night. That's right. That's right, and the temperature is going to drop, so I'm going to record the temperature drop here. The birds will go quiet. Uh, the clouds may be a little bit much. Even if it's partly sunny, we wouldn't be able to see bright stars and planets, but where it's clear skies, you will see bright stars and planets. Which is, that is just, it's amazing. And But, yeah, the experience of this yeah. is still wonderful. It's still going to go dark, and that's why I think those people are just... You know, we may not see the sun, but it's the experience. Yeah. Mandy, Chris. But fingers across we could do this. Jan, the path is moving, the, sh the shadow is moving along 1,200, about 1,500 miles an hour. We're going to get only about four and a half minutes of totality. And the path width is only about 115 miles wide. 
So Mandy, I'm, I'm so excited about this. Great to see you both. Oh my goodness, Chris. How awesome uh, is it to see you again? 20 years in the making right here, 20 year friendship. <laughs> Mandy, you gotta get him to do the Su Chan Shuffle. That is legendary. So maybe maybe uh, one time. Oh. I know all you about it. There okay. you go, right there, right, right there. <laughs> That's what you'll be doing yes. today when we see the solar eclipse. All right. Sorry good. you had to endure that. Yep. Yeah. That's great to see you both. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Ahead this morning, we're talking more about the border crisis as well. New illegal entries caught on camera as more U.S. cities are strained from the surge of migrants. And here at the live desk, the latest after a deadly weekend shooting near downtown Miami. Two people dead, a half dozen injured. We're going to have the details coming up in 90 seconds. And victims are recovering this morning after a deadly weekend shooting at a martini bar inside of a busy shopping center in downtown Miami on Saturday. Police say the shooter was taken out by officers at the scene. Sadly, we've learned, though, that the other person killed was the head security at Durrell's martini bar, George Castellanos, just 20 three years old. Police say two patrons apparently got into some sort of an argument and Castellanos was shot twice while trying to break up that fight. He leaves behind a girlfriend and his one-year-old daughter. Now, six other people were shot, including a police officer and the owner of that martini bar. Thankfully, though, all those victims are expected to survive. Good news, though. Um, we have her in custody and you have Teddy as well. You do? Oh my gosh. Where's my son? Caught on camera, the emotional moment a father learned his four year old son was found safe and alive. Yesterday's Amber Alert in Washington State now, now canceled after police found the boy with his mother who did not have legal custody. Authorities say she went to his grandparents' house and took him in the middle of the night. They say she recently got out of prison and made threats to harm the boy and herself. Well, hours later, police spotted the vehicle she was driving and arrested her. The boy was there unharmed, and now this morning, back in his dad's arms. And new information about an arson at the Vermont office of Senator Bernie Sanders. Burlington police did arrest a 35-year-old man from California. The arrest made hours after police released these surveillance images. They say the suspect set fire to the building on Friday. No one was injured. New signs of progress to clean up the Baltimore Harbor after the deadly bridge collapse. Salvage crews began removing containers from the deck of the cargo ship that crashed into the bridge, and workers are removing parts of the bridge that fell onto the ship. Maryland Governor Wes Moore said he hopes they can get the harbor running as normal again by the end of May. 
We're checking to see if Friday's jobs numbers could be revised down after that happened with 12 of the past 14 reports. On Friday, the Bureau of Labor Statistics did report 303,000 workers were hired last month, but the job gains have largely gone to foreign-born workers, both legal and illegal immigrants. From February 2020 to this past March, the number of migrant workers grew to 3.4 million, while the number of U.S.-born workers declined by 78,000 over the same period. And we continue to follow the border crisis with more signs that migrants are trying to enter the U.S. illegally. The National Desk's Kayla Gaskins reports. New video from the southern border shows a crowd of migrants cutting razor wire to enter Texas illegally under the cover of night. The video reportedly taken this past week from the Mexican side of the border in Ciudad Juarez. Some migrants appear to make it through. Others pushed back by Texas forces. Back the up. You get any closer. The installation of this razor wire along the border is central to an ongoing federal legal battle between Texas and the U.S. Justice Department. Illegal immigration into Texas has gone down 72 percent because of the resistance that we've put up has gone up, however, uh, in the other border states. Meanwhile, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas calling Abbott's effort ineffective when talking to reporters on Friday. Mayorkas accusing Texas of purposefully trying to create disorder at the border. Abbott says they're simply cleaning up a mess made by Washington. Joe Biden has uh, created this open border policy that has allowed illegal immigrants into our country uh, to uh, appeal to and to appease uh, the far leftist uh, in the Democrat Party. Look, there is a challenge at the border, right? Our immigration system has been broken for decades before, even before this president became president, obviously, three years, more than three years ago. Last week, Texas arresting 214 migrants involved in a riot at the border on March 21st. As Texas cracks down, fellow border states like California are experiencing an uptick in illegal crossings. It used to be in previous administrations uh, in Washington, D.C., when people would come across the country illegally, they would try to avoid Border Patrol. Now they run to the Border Patrol. They know all the right questions to ask and statements to make to, to ask for asylum. This comes as more and more voters see immigration problems impacting other big issues like crime, drugs, national spending, and national security, making immigration the number one issue for most voters as they look ahead to November's elections. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins. And right here at the live desk, an investigation launched into Boeing after another major failure of their 737 MAX fleet. The details coming up 90 seconds.
U.S. airline regulators have launched an investigation into Boeing after an engine cover flew off during takeoff and then hit the wing flat. Now, we have some of this video for you right here. You can see it right back here. Parts of the flame flying off as the plane is taking off. 135 passengers were on that flight that took off from Denver, heading to Houston's Hobby Airport on Sunday. After the incident, the plane really just turned around and landed safely in Denver. Thankfully, no injuries were reported. The FAA is also investigating several other recent Boeing issues that could cost the company big money, including a criminal investigation into an incident back in January where a plane, a door plug, a door uh, plug panel tore off an Alaska Airlines 737 MAX 9 jet. Angela, thanks so much. Uh, also ahead in our next half hour, closing the gap. Former President Trump hauling in a historic amount of cash, spelling trouble for President Biden's re-election bid. I'm meteorologist Emily Santa, and let's take a look at the northeast for highs for today. Mostly in Maine and New Hampshire and Massachusetts, we're looking at low 50s, 47 up in Caribou, Maine for the solar eclipse. 70s over in New York, we're looking around 75 for Syracuse, 72 for Buffalo, 75 for New York City. We'll start to see some clouds come into New York. Temperatures still into the 50s, but by solar eclipse time, we're looking at best views possible in northern Vermont, New Hampshire, and over in Maine. I'm Chief Meteorologist Gerard Bailey. Here's a look at your weather across the Mid-Atlantic region. We're looking at mostly clear skies through the time of the eclipse. Very good news. We'll be able to see most of what's going on. There will be some pockets of clouds. We're talking 30 to perhaps 50% coverage. A few showers move through after the fact, but better rain chances coming as we head later into the week. Temperatures are going to soar this week a little bit here. We'll likely hit the 60s no problem on Monday. 70s on tap for Tuesday. I'm meteorologist Vitas Reed. Here's a look at your southeast forecast highs. We're looking at 75 Nashville, 77 in Raleigh, 80 Birmingham, 85 in Tampa, 77 in West Palm. We do have a few scattered showers that is going to kind of give a hard time for folks across Tennessee, up around northern uh, Georgia for the viewing of the eclipse down over parts of uh, Mississippi and ten, uh, eastern Texas. But over southern Georgia and also along the Carolinas, it looks pretty good through the afternoon. Just a few high clouds over, clouds over Florida. Looks like we'll get that front pushing through late week. Well, a very good Monday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael. A little wet weather across the northern plains for the day today. The eclipse will be happening. Path of totality going about right where my hand is. And we've got some pretty decent weather across the Midwest to check out the total solar eclipse happening today. Tomorrow, rain starts moving in a little bit more. The plains pretty quiet for the day tomorrow, but more rain will be filling in for the Ohio Valley heading into your Wednesday. Good Monday morning. I'm meteorologist Joe DiCarlo. Look at our forecast across the region. Solar eclipse day. We'll start with low level clouds across Texas. More clear skies though, Oklahoma and Arkansas. So here's the eclipse time frame around 1, 1 30 to 2. We will have mainly cloudy conditions across South Texas. Some breaks in the clouds as you head towards North Texas and uh, partly sunny skies throughout Arkansas. After the eclipse, it's severe weather chances, especially across North Texas and Southern Oklahoma. All modes of severe weather will be possible. Good morning, I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. Temperatures gradually warming up again from California up into the Pacific Northwest. But as we move from temperatures into an incoming storm, it is a warm front and we've got rain at times with mountain snow tracking into the Pacific Northwest with scattered rain showers in the afternoon from much of the mountain areas of the Southwest. That's the scene from here.
The National Desk, America's News Now. Now on the National Desk, America's News Now back to work. Right now in Washington, Congress faces a laundry list of priorities that are putting the House Speaker's position at risk. Closing the gap, former President Trump hauling in record donations as the Republican Party focuses on taking back the White House. Also, I think everyone should, should experience an eclipse at least once in their life, a total eclipse. It's, it's like I said, it's, it's just an amazing astronomical event. Eclipse across America, a lot of excitement today, but those eclipse expectations are at risk by some dangerous weather. I'll tell you where shortly here. And thanks for joining us. You are watching the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Jan Jeffcoat. It's Monday, April 8th, and the wait is just about over with some visibility of the eclipse starting in just hours from now. Angela Brown, though, has been at the live desk tracking its path and the weather problems already getting in the way. What are you seeing, Angela? Well, you know, the clouds are out in some areas, but we're watching what's going to happen later on today because more than 31 million Americans are in the path of today's total solar eclipse, including those in Dallas, Texas, uh, the area you see right behind me where the sun is up. But the path right here is highlighted. You can see right here to my left, spanning across 15 U.S. states and parts of Canada and also Mexico. Today's event really is a once-in-a-lifetime experience for many. But the view could be blocked out by storm clouds in some areas. Texas is likely to have the heaviest cloud cover with severe weather forecasted for around eclipse time in some parts. Here's a look at the path of totality. The eclipse will begin in Mexico around 11.07 a.m. local time and then will cross over into Texas about 1.27 p.m. and will end in Maine around 3.35. Officials, kind of like in the, in the path of those cities in the direct path, are issuing warnings right now ahead of the massive amounts of eclipse tourists that have already arrived in their cities over the weekend. Our national desk partners in Tulsa, Oklahoma, spoke with troopers uh, with the Oklahoma Highway Patrol. Don't drive and take pictures with your cell phone. We respectfully request that you don't stop uh, on the sides of the roads. With the infrastructure, um, with one-lane roads, it's going to be difficult getting in and getting out. And a live look at the National Desk Radar for you as well this morning. And you can see that band of storms heading over Middle Tennessee right here. Again, the most cloud cover expected in the Dallas, Texas region. The good news, though, for eclipse watchers who get clouded or even rained out, you can watch our live coverage today on the nationaldesk.com. Tune in between 1 and 4 p.m. Eastern as we track the eclipse from coast to coast. Again, that's online at the nationaldesk.com. Angela, thank you. It's going to be very exciting to see that. And today, Congress returns to Capitol Hill from Easter recess and leaders are laying out their priorities. First up, Mike Johnson's position as House Speaker at risk over talks about future aid to Ukraine. This week, he is expected to release his own proposals on money for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Johnson said the funding may be split into separate packages and is being pressured by House and Senate Republicans to use leverage to strengthen border security. What we have is the ability to say you don't get money for your priorities unless you do what the American people need you to do. And unfortunately, whether it's Mitch McConnell or unfortunately too many House Republicans, there's been an unwillingness from our leadership to use that leverage. On Wednesday, House impeachment managers are also set to deliver the articles of impeachment against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to the Senate. Back in February, Mayorkas became the first cabinet secretary to be impeached in 150 years. Democratic senators, though, are expected to perhaps delay the trial or dismiss it altogether. And this week, Congress will also consider the approval and conditions for funds to rebuild the Key Bridge in Baltimore after its collapse. The House Freedom Caucus has called on the Biden administration to lift its paws on approvals for natural gas export projects before discussing funding. People are just wanting change. The rich people want it, poor people want it. Everybody wants change. The country is really doing poorly. We're a laughing stock all over the world. We're going to get that changed very quickly. Former President Trump shattering his campaign fundraising records over the weekend. The Republican National Committee said Trump hauled in more than $50 million during an event in Palm Beach, Florida. We are going to spend every single dollar that we raise on two key critical core missions for the RNC, which are getting out the vote 
and protecting the ballot. And uh, we're going to make sure that we are focusing on the battleground states and districts where we need to be competitive and making sure that every dollar that we raise is going to be putting lead on target. The Biden campaign says it has more than $192 million on hand. Trump's campaign says they have $93 million. Later this week, Trump is traveling to Atlanta, where the RNC is holding a similar fundraising event. Meantime, Democrats threatening the Republican House majority and the details of their strategy are being revealed. The House Majority PAC, which is aligned with House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, said it plans to spend $186 million on television and digital ads for this November's election. Democrats need to flip just four seats, and the group said it's spending most of that money in vulnerable Republican districts in New York and California. And in Wisconsin, former gas station chain owner Tony Wide is expected to announce a run to replace retiring Congressman Mike Gallagher. This also comes after former President Trump endorsed Wyde ahead of a big announcement today, writing, quote, As your next congressman, Tony will work hard to unleash American energy, stop inflation, secure our border, support our military vets, and protect our always under siege Second Amendment. This morning, Republicans in Ohio are warning that President Biden's name may not appear on the presidential ballot there in November. National Desk's Christine Frizzell joins us live on Capitol Hill. Christine, what's behind this? What's going on here? Yeah, Jan, so the state deadline in Ohio to certify a presidential candidate uh, is 90 days before the general election, which this year falls on November 5th. That puts the deadline on August 7th. But the official nominating convention for Democrats, the, D the DNC, is not scheduled to convene until August 19th. So what can be done? Well, two things. Either the DNC, which has had the convention center and agenda set for months now, not to mention all the people going and hotel rooms booked, they would have to move up its convention. Or the Ohio General Assembly would need to vote on creating an exception to this rule. It's also hard to imagine that happening since the Republican Party controls offices of governor, secretary of state, and both chambers of the legislature. The last time a Democrat won in Ohio uh, in, in a presidential election was Barack Obama, both in 2008 and 2012. But the Biden campaign insists they're confident Joe Biden's name will appear on the ballot in all 50 states. But I think this is interesting and something you might want to keep your eyes on. I'm Christine Frizzout for The National Desk. It's very interesting, Christine. Thank you so much. Tonight, the big dance will end with the NCAA Men's College Basketball Championship. The Purdue Boilermakers are trying to stop the Connecticut Huskies who are searching for a back-to-back -back title at 9.20 p.m. Eastern. On the women's side, the South Carolina Gamecocks back on top of the college basketball world yesterday. The South Carolina women's team did wrap up their perfect 3-0 season, beating Iowa and Caitlin Clark 75-87. Utilize this opportunity to thank Caitlin for what she's done for women's basketball. Like, her, her shoulders were heavy and getting a lot of eyeballs on our game. I think anytime somebody like Coach Daly is able to recognize you and what you did for the game is, is pretty special. And obviously she's somebody I, you know, respect so much. Iowa's Caitlin Clark has declared for the WNBA draft and of course is expected to be the first overall pick this season. She had the all-time scoring record across both men's and women's college basketball and really it's just a lot of fun to watch. Straight ahead on the national desk, COVID complications. Millions of Americans still have lingering issues. The signs you should watch out for and what you can do if you are experiencing some of those symptoms. Also, animals and the eclipse. Vets warning about the rare phenomenon and the impact it could have on man's best friend.
A new government study shows 25% of American adults still have lingering issues after COVID, including blood clots, which can turn deadly. So what are the signs you need to watch out for, and is there anything you can do to prevent it? Well, joining us now to discuss is CEO of MedHelp Clinics, Dr. Jordan Vaughn. Good morning to you. Dr. Good morning. Vaughn, great to see you. Now, this recently came back into the headlines with Colorado Congresswoman Lauren Boebert, who underwent surgery, as we know, last Tuesday to remove uh, a blood clot and was subsequently diagnosed with May Therner syndrome. First, tell us what this condition is and is there a link to these blood clots and COVID? Yeah, so May, May Therner is basically a uh, area of the body, especially in the pelvic venous area, that, that has the iliac vein lacking good venous return. And when that happens, you have the more uh, likelihood that somebody's going to have venous stasis or lack of vein or blood movement. And you combine that with things like a hypercoagulable state or damage to the inside of the vessels, which both of which COVID does. And you kind of have, you meet all the criteria, the three criteria we usually have to produce blood clots, lack of blood movement, hypercoagulability, and damage to the vessel. How does May Therner syndrome put more pressure on the veins and arteries to increase the chance of a blood clot forming? And how does COVID increase that risk? So May Therner is, uh, is a better name is actually what we call iliac vein compression. So the iliac vein is a vein in your pelvis and that vein is responsible. It's kind of the highway out of your pelvis for the used blood, your venous blood. And when that gets compressed or basically has the artery above it smashing down on it against your uh, ver vertebrae, your spine, you limit the amount of flow. Imagine it kind of like uh, pressing down on a hose and uh, limiting the amount of, of total volume that can get back to your heart easily. So what are the symptoms and how can this be prevented? So most of these people, especially in the post-COVID state, can have a lot of leg heaviness. They can also have leg swelling. Pre predominant area for this iliac vein to be co uh, compressed is on the left side. So given that, a lot of times they definitely have symptoms that are worse on the left or on the right. The other interesting thing is once you block the highway out of the pelvis, what happens is your body is going to still look for back roads and those back roads are going to be all these other venous collaterals. Those collaterals can go over your bladder, over your uterus, over your GI tract, over your uh, sacral spine. So in a sense, it can cause increased urinary frequency, heavy menstrual cycles or pelvic pain. It can cause hemorrhoids or GI upset. It can also cause sacral back pain, back pain in your tailbone. So are you seeing these types of clots in your patients who've had COVID? I am, and in fact, a lot of it I am seeing before the clots actually develop. A lot of them come to me after the clots, but a lot of them come initially with the symptoms, and at least they're active enough so they can continue to move beyond the compression. But for the most part, when they're moving, they feel like they are not feeling the same at all anymore. A lot of the people that I see are very active, very slender, uh, almost runners, ultramarathon type people. And what they tell me is all of a sudden, I, I can't run at all without my legs feeling extremely heavy and my heart beating very fast and me feeling short of breath. The other thing that's interesting is that if you don't get good venous return to your heart, your heart isn't gonna have the amount of blood to pump forward. And so in that sense, a lot of these symptoms can also be cardiac in terms of high heart rate out of proportion to what they're exerting, or it can be shortness of breath. Women between the ages of 20 and 45 who have given birth are more likely, as we know, to have May Therner syndrome. Bobert, for instance, has four children. So how common is this and who else is at risk? So interestingly enough, prior to uh, COVID, I would say this was a predominantly just women's issue. And in fact, that's what's so interesting in my practice. Prior to this, it would have been 99% women that had any issues with May Therner. But now about 40% of the people I see are men, which is wow. again, showing me that all of a sudden there's a new thing that is mixing into the, the pathology, which is COVID. Again, women have progesterone, estrogen, uteruses, and babies, which are usually the way that you have trauma or issues with this iliac vein uh, architecture in the pelvis. But men and women equally get COVID and equally get vaccinated. And given that the spike protein damages the endothelium and makes your blood more hypercoagulable, if you have a May Therner type anatomy, it is more likely that you might suffer from this. What other types of lingering conditions uh, have you seen emerge since COVID that you didn't see prior? A lot of it can be the pulmonary vasculature is another area with a lot of veins and arteries. And given that, uh, again, 
COVID is a vascular disease and the spike protein damages the small vessels. Uh, the small vessels in your lungs are responsible for getting oxygen to your tissues. And so if you don't get oxygen to your tissues, uh, in a sense, uh, you're not only uh, not going to really operate right, but you're going to feel very fatigued. And, you know, the most common areas of that is brain fog, shortness of breath. And the other thing we would cause is post-exertional malaise. It is as if you do something and uh, almost feel out of proportion to how you feel the next day, like you don't really recover well. It's fascinating what we're learning post-COVID right now. Uh, CEO of MedHelp Clinics, Dr. Jordan Vaughn. We certainly appreciate uh -huh. you joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And here at the live desk, former President Donald Trump made a major announcement this morning regarding his stance on abortion access. We'll hear his take on the future impacting American families. That's up in 90 seconds. And breaking right here at the live desk, the battle over abortion access turning out to be a major player in the race for the White House. And just in the last hour, former President Donald Trump laid out his plans impacting the future of that national debate. The former president announcing on Truth Social that he believes states should hold the power to make that call either by vote or by legislation. He also believes in preserving the availability of IVF treatment for American families. Here's part of what he said. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks, or some will have more conservative than others, and that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. This marks really a pivotal moment in the 2024 presidential race as Democrats make abortion central to their case against former President Donald Trump. We're going to bring you any more details as they come in right here at the live desk. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. We have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From protecting eyes to preparing pets, the Pulse of America is getting you ready for today's solar eclipse. And we start with a lot of folks scrambling to get the best view possible. I just, I came in here, I saw the prepare for the eclipse on the 8th, there's a sign up there, and I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled. I saw my brother, and I can't wait. She's one of thousands of people expected to travel here, all to catch a view. Eclipse chasers Lori and Robert Paz came all the way from California. Yeah, I think everyone should should experience an eclipse at least once in their life, a total eclipse. It's, it's like I said, it's, it's just an amazing astronomical event. The eclipse bringing families together, like Kate McKay's. We have family flying in from um, other parts of the country, too, to come up and, and see it. And Phyllis Browns. Her son organized a family reunion, inviting everyone. Um, it's turned out quite a few people are joining us here for the eclipse. And, of course, we don't know that we'll be able to see the sun because it's Rochester, but we'll be out on Lake Ontario, east of Rochester, and um, it'll be fun no matter what. If you look at the sun, even just for a couple seconds, you actually may have some damage to the back of the eye that you might not know about for a little while. Local optometrist Dr. Zachary Long explains why looking at an eclipse can lead to serious health concerns. 
the sun coming around is actually having that UV damage. That UV damage can get centered in the very back of the eye in our central vision spot. Well, if that happens, you might lose vision forever. He also mentioned that there are some people more susceptible to UV damage. A child has a very clear lens inside the eye, and that lens is going to focus all of that damage to the very back of the eye. And unfortunately, it's a one and done. And you only have one set of eyeballs, so make sure that you take care of them. The main way to safely see the solar eclipse is with special glasses. You're going to notice that they're a lot darker than sunglasses, and so you can't really see out of them. And so the whole idea behind wearing these is we've got solar filters in here, and so those solar filters are going to protect the eye. We don't have concrete answers. Because while Dr. Gingrich knows just about everything there is to know about pets, no one really knows what these do to them. There's very little scientific research behind animal behavior and eclipses. Of course, we've had eclipses before, not quite to the totality we're expecting this time around in a long time. But still, that leads Dr. Gingrich to predict. I would not be overly concerned about this eclipse. But she admits. You know your animal more than the veterinarian you come to. Which means if you have a pet that in the past has environmental triggers like fireworks or storms or whatever it may be, then your animal might be a little more sensitive to the eclipse's consequences. Do your best in making them feel as comfortable as you think they would want to be. A San Francisco lawmaker getting slammed after introducing a proposal that would allow residents to sue over grocery store closings if there is not enough notice. Under the proposed legislation, San Francisco grocery stores would be required to give a six-month warning and look for a replacement for itself. This comes as the city deals with a rise in violent crime, homelessness, and drug use that's forced many stores to shut down for good. Controversial EV mandates are staying in New Mexico after auto dealers' efforts to stop its implementation were denied. By 2032, four out of five cars shipped to the state have to have zero emissions. Auto dealers say these rules will cost thousands of jobs and do irreparable harm to the economy. Navajo Nation leaders also say this will have a tremendous negative impact on their community because they simply do not have the infrastructure to mm. charge EVs. And here with the live desk, we are counting down, continuing coverage as we near that once in a lifetime view of a total solar eclipse where some stargazers could get their view blocked coming up in 90 seconds. And we are counting down to today's total solar eclipse set to cross over more than a dozen U.S. states. You can see the map right here, parts of Canada and also parts of Mexico. But the view could be blocked out by storm clouds in some areas. Texas likely to have the heaviest cloud cover with severe weather forecasted for around eclipse time, which is about 1.40 this afternoon. The eclipse will begin in Mexico about 11.07 a.m. local time, cross over to Texas about 1.27 central, ending in Maine at 3.35 Eastern. Now, we will have more coverage throughout the morning right here at the live desk, and we'll also be streaming it live when it happens this afternoon on the nationaldesk.com. But for now, we leave you with this look at America's news and weather now where you live.
I'm meteorologist Emily Sancho, and let's take a look at the Northeast for highs for today. Mostly in Maine and New Hampshire and Massachusetts, we're looking at low 50s, 47 up in Caribou, Maine for the solar eclipse. 70s over in New York, we're looking around 75 for Syracuse, 72 for Buffalo, 75 for New York City. We'll start to see some clouds come into New York. Temperatures still into the 50s, but by solar eclipse time, we're looking at best views possible in northern Vermont, New Hampshire, and over in Maine. I'm Chief Meteorologist Gerard Bailey. Here's a look at your weather across the Mid-Atlantic region. We're looking at mostly clear skies through the time of the eclipse. Very good news. We'll be able to see most of what's going on. There will be some pockets of clouds. We're talking 30 to perhaps 50% coverage. A few showers move through after the fact, but better rain chances coming as we head later into the week. Temperatures are going to soar this week a little bit here. We'll likely hit the 60s, no problem, on Monday. 70s on tap for Tuesday. I'm meteorologist Vitas Reed. Here's a look at your southeast forecast highs. We're looking at 75 Nashville, 77 in Raleigh, 80 Birmingham, 85 in Tampa, 77 in West Palm. We do have a few scattered showers that is going to kind of give a hard time for folks across Tennessee, up around northern uh, Georgia for the viewing of the eclipse down over parts of uh, Mississippi and ten, uh, eastern Texas. But over southern Georgia and also along the Carolinas, it looks pretty good through the afternoon. Just a few high clouds over, clouds over Florida. Looks like we'll get that front pushing through late week. Well, a very good Monday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael. A little wet weather across the northern plains for the day today. The eclipse will be happening. Path of totality going about right where my hand is, and we've got some pretty decent weather across the Midwest to check out the total solar eclipse happening today. Tomorrow, rain starts moving in a little bit more. The plains, pretty quiet for the day tomorrow, but more rain will be filling in for the Ohio Valley heading into your Wednesday. Good Monday morning. I'm meteorologist Joe DiCarlo. Look at our forecast across the region. Solar eclipse day. We'll start with low-level clouds across Texas. More clear skies though, Oklahoma and Arkansas. So here's the eclipse time frame around 1, 1 to 2. We will have mainly cloudy conditions across South Texas. Some breaks in the clouds as you head towards North Texas and uh, partly sunny skies throughout Arkansas. After the eclipse, it's severe weather chances, especially across North Texas and Southern Oklahoma. All modes of severe weather will be possible. Good morning, I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. Temperatures gradually warming up again from California up into the Pacific Northwest. But as we move from temperatures into an incoming storm, it is a warm front and we've got rain at times with mountain snow tracking into the Pacific Northwest with scattered rain showers in the afternoon from much of the mountain areas of the Southwest. That's the scene from here.